Good e uh, I've got to move the markers. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Paul Schlickman. I am vice chair of the Arlington School Committee. Uh, Dr. Kersey Allison Ampey is our esteemed chair, but she is spending the evening with uh, her daughter at her very, very, very last uh, gymnastics banquet. Uh, so we wish her well, and we proceed uh, from here. It is officially 6.34 p.m. on Thursday, June 15th, and we are operating in a hybrid manner consistent with, uh, with the law. Um, all the members of the committee are present, so we don't need to do an electronic roll call. First item of business is uh, public comment. Uh, I'll read the ground rules, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, and then we'll proceed. Uh, for members of the public who wish to address the committee, there will be a 20-minute public comment period. If you would like to sign up to speak, either remotely via Zoom or in person, you must email ediggins at arlingtonk12.ma.us by 6 p.m. Thursday at the date of the, uh, the meeting. Depending on how many people sign up, time allotments may be reduced but will not exceed the three minutes each. If the number of people who sign up exceeds what can be reasonably done in 20 minutes, and that's the case tonight, the number of speakers may be capped or speaking times may be reduced at the discretion of the chair. All requests to speak received after the date and time indicated will be invited to speak at the next school committee regular meeting. We do have 19 people signed up. We cannot do 19 people in 20 minutes, so I think the compromise will be to reduce speaking time to two minutes and extend to 30 minutes. Once we hit the 30-minute mark, which will be at 6.36 plus 30, which will be 7.06 on my clock, we will terminate uh, public comment even if we have not exhausted the speakers. So I'm going to tell people who are coming up in certain order so this next person in line will be ready. So the first person to speak will be Sarah Lamb Barton, who will be followed by David Valdez. Sarah, Sarah Barton in the room, thank you. I better get my clock up now if we're doing two minutes. Yep. I have one too. All right, good evening school committee members. I'm Sarah Barton, I live at 57 Huntington Road and I'm also the CPAC co-chair. Uh, you may recall that at the April 27th meeting, I spoke during public comment in support of a gender-inclusive health and human development curriculum, noting the importance of accurate, inclusive sex and relationship education for disabled students. That evening, I concluded my comments by urging the school committee to explicitly reaffirm the district's commitment to gender inclusivity. At the very next school committee meeting, I sat right behind me here, and listen to two of our youth provide heart-rending testimony about the impact that exclusion within the APS system has had on their mental health and well-being and their ability to grow and thrive in this community. I firmly believe that public support for our gender diverse students and staff from this body is required if you intend to keep your commitment to providing safe and supportive schools which is why I was encouraged to see a resolution affirming the LGBTQIA community on tonight's agenda. Ms. Exton and Ms. Gittleson have drafted a clear and cogent statement in support of LGBTQIA members of the APS community, and I thank them for that. You may also recall that during my April 27th comment, I expressed my dismay that the committee chose to focus on a procedural discussion of policies designed to avoid confrontation rather than a full-throated defense of the district's commitment to inclusion and equity. I would urge the committee not to make the same mistake again. No one has ever felt supported, welcomed, or empowered by a subcommittee review of the policies of the Arlington School Committee. The inclusion of concrete actions in the resolution including affirming the rights of all APS community members to be called by their requested names to access athletic and curricular activities, as well as a commitment to professional development and the posting of these affirmations at our school buildings will go a long way towards making our community a safer place for our gender diverse members. Thank you, your time has expired. David Valdez, followed by Claire Johnson. My name is David Valdez. I uh, live at 6 Walnut Street here in Arlington. When I was 15 years old, I went to a school that was uh, very homophobic. I climbed a bridge in my town to jump off it. 
and a neighbor stopped me. Uh, in the time since then, I'm glad to be alive. I have now, as an educator, I just crossed the 4,000 student mark, and I'm glad that I could be there for them. My college roommate was a trans woman who told me the story of when she was six and discovered that at school she would have to go by her birth name and have to dress as a boy. She threw herself out of the back of her family's truck. She lived, she today is, uh, she works for the United Nations uh, uh, policing um, human rights. I tell you these stories because it is important that a school not just passively say we are okay, but schools embrace students and support them in the ways that they can. The bill that you have before you, Exton Gittleson, is a bill that proactively does that, protects inclusion, and makes students feel welcome. The amendment to sort of soften things and to kind of look at things again will just slow the roll. I encourage you, I beg you, I plead with you to stand up for your students and to make them welcome in Arlington. Thank you. I yield my time. Thank you. Uh, Claire Johnson is next, followed by, will be followed by Hillary Clay. Hello, my name is Claire Johnson. I am a resident of Arlington at 84 Wright Street. My family is gender diverse and a part of APS. I'm here tonight to ask you to support the Pride Proclamation written by school committee members Liz Exton and Laura Gietelson. I'm asking you to reject the amendment proclamation proposed by school committee member Len Cardin. Given all that you have heard from members of the public over the past few weeks, the proposed amendment is not sufficient. It is a weak promise to take action at some undefined date in the future. I came before you weeks ago to offer public comment on these issues and you have been hearing from other members of the community for nearly two months now. Again, I share that our family is incredibly grateful for the experiences we have had with the Arlington Public Schools. Our teachers and staff have shown they understand and recognize gender diversity. The pride proclamation offered by Liz Exton and Laura Gietelson is a good step in the right direction for the Arlington School Committee. The proposed amendment after all that has happened in Arlington is incredibly weak and honestly borders on insulting. The Arlington School Committee has a chance now to change its reputation of ignoring the experiences faced by LGBTQ students in our schools. Thank you for your time, your dedication, and your work. Thank you. Uh, Hillary Clay is next, followed by Colin Bunnell. Hello, my name is Hillary Clay. I live at 438 Appleton in Arlington, and I'm the parent of a fourth grade student at Dallin. I asked to speak tonight to address the resolutions put together by the school committee affirming the LGBTQ plus community, which are being talked about later this evening. I wanted to voice my support for the obvious care and thought that was put into crafting these resolutions. I feel it is the intention of the school committee to help protect this community and foster increased understanding and awareness. There are two drafts of these resolutions. They're similar in tone, but the first draft includes particular action items that I think are incredibly important, and I want to encourage the school committee to vote in favor of this first draft. It's one thing to say that we are going to support the community, but the first resolution includes distinct steps to take to make sure that support becomes a reality. One of these action items is to include the discussion of LGBTQ plus people and issues in the health and sex education, which is such an important step for inclusion. One of the action items is to support the use of preferred pronouns, which is such an important step for inclusion. One of these action items is to include books in the library that portray LGBTQ plus people in a positive light, which is such an important step for inclusion. These are all concrete actions that will help support our student population, and I feel so strongly that this draft of the re resolution could make a difference in helping the very real children that are affected by these policy decisions. My fourth grader identifies as non-binary. They've spent a lot of time explaining what this means to their classmates, and it was incredibly helpful to them to have gender topics come in, in the health come into the health and sex education classes that they had during the year. It's been a profoundly positive experience for my child to have their teacher embrace their pronouns and support their gender expression throughout the year. Every child deserves to have this type of support. I urge the school committee to please pass the first draft of this resolution, which will help make this affirmation and support into a reality for all of our students. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, Colin uh, Bunnell is next, but will be followed by Sarah McKinnon. My name is Colin Bunnell, and I'm a former town meeting member from Precinct 5. 
I request this committee support the Exton Gittleson resolution and reject the proposed Cardin amendment. Nothing in the Exton Gittleson resolution should pose a controversy. There is no good faith reason not to call a person by their actual name or their correct pronouns. Equal access to services and facilities is not controversial, especially in a town as progressive as Arlington. Training and professional development to guide and support faculty and staff in treating queer and trans colleagues and students respectfully is not controversial. Widely disseminating the contents of the resolution so all understand this committee's ironclad support for the LGBTQ community is not controversial, yet all of these provisions of the resolution are stricken in the Cardin Amendment, leaving behind just a feel-good shell of a resolution without action to match. Nationwide, the rights of queer and transgender people are under assault. This is not just in states like Florida and Texas. Queer and trans communities in our state are under threat from extremist organizations like the Massachusetts Family Institute. Passage of the Cardin Amendment will be construed as this committee wavering in its support of the transgender community and will invite further attacks from those who would seek to exploit divisions in pursuit of political power. Clear, unambiguous support for queer and trans students is the best way to convey that homophobic and transphobic extremism will find no refuge in Arlington. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Sarah McKinnon is next. will be followed by Carolyn Vincent. Thank you very much. My name is Sarah McKinnon. I live um, at 10 Kilsai Road, and I'm a town meeting member for Precinct 20. I have been so struck by what has been said already, and that I'm sure in this room you can imagine many of the things that the LGBTQIA community and their allies would be saying in terms of how the um, Exton and Gittleson resolution is really a call for normalization not for exceptionalism. This is for equal, equal existence within the schools. And we're writing what is off balance. I'd say that the difference that I see between the two resolutions that were um, proposed is that one is very, both are very strong in saying where we are strong already as a community. Both have sympathy and support but the latter one stops at subcommittee. The Exton Gittleson resolution is clear, concise, it gives us a plan, and if we do need a policies and procedures subcommittee to support, it can support action where we have barriers. It can support in creating, removing older or unnecessary barriers that would allow us to clearly and concisely take these areas for improvement, say the library, determine what is our goal, diversity of LGBTQIA plus figures portrayed in a positive light, and the action item is clear, materials. If there is anything that stops us from doing that, then the Policies and Procedures Committee can help, can support, not support in developing, in developing action that's been done. So I urge you to please support the Exton and Gittleson resolution. It is truly a resolution and not a hope. Thank you. Thank you. Carolyn Vincent and Noelle Roop will follow. Hi, I'm Carolyn Vincent. I live at 9 Colby Road. I am a um, over 20 year resident of Arlington and I have two children who are working their way through the school system here. Um, I also have extensively volunteered with K through 12 children both in and out of school in the town of Arlington. Um, many speakers before me have been much more eloquent. I am just here in support of the Exton Gettleston. Thank you. Thank you. Noelle Roop is next. Then we'll be going to remotes. The first remote speaker will be Keith Marzilli Erickson. Good evening, everyone. My name is Noelle Roop. I live at 16 Shawnee Road here in Arlington. I'm a proud parent of two Arlington public school kids, a second grader and an eighth grader who's graduating tomorrow. Um, professionally, I have worn many hats. I have been a school psychologist, an educational psychologist, and uh, currently I am a full-time faculty member at Tufts University where I teach graduate school psychology students. In 2014, I published a body of research conducted over several years 
on the experience of trans and non-binary students in educational settings. The recommendations generated from that body of work still apply today. More importantly than that body of research are the recommendations from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education here in the state of Massachusetts, which identify representation and curriculum, validation and respect, and the validation of chosen names, intrinsic gender identities, gender markers, all as key elements for supporting trans and non-binary students. In 2021-2022, the Arlington Public Schools conducted an equity audit in which they identified LGBTQ plus students as a priority student group. The recommendations that came from that equity audit found its way into our five-year strategic plan. The resolution noticed the Pride Proclamation is most closely aligned with that five-year strategic plan, the DESE recommendations, as well as the National Association of School Psychology's Safe and Supportive Schools for LGBTQ plus Youth Position Statement. The difference between the two resolutions before us here tonight is small but critical. A goal without a plan is a wish. Tonight's amended resolution exists without clarity as to what we are proclaiming to do regarding the inclusion and representation, health and well-being of our LGBTQ plus students. The Pride Proclamation resolution identifies requested names and pronouns be respected, that equal access to programs and facilities occur, that there's privacy for students, that there's participation in all activities, that there's representation, professional development, training and protections. Thank you, time has expired. Great. Uh, first up on the remote is Keith Marzilli Erickson, who will be followed by Sophia Westerhoff. Uh, Keith, are you? I'm here. Uh, Can you hear go, me? Go for it. Here we go. Two minutes. I'm Keith Marzilli Erickson. I'm a resident at 85 Coolidge Road. I'm a parent of two children at the Brackett School. I'm a professor of markets, public policy, and law at Boston University. And I'm here today to ask you to support the Pride Resolution written by members Exton and Gittleson and reject the amended version proposed by Lynn Cardin. It's important that action be taken to promote the well-being of Arlington's LGBTQ plus youth to, and to give Arlington's non-queer youth a well-rounded education. The amended resolution does not take concrete action and we've already waited too long. These actions should not be controversial. We know LGBTQ youth are suffering. We have evidence they experience harassment, high rates of depression. Respecting student and staff pronoun choice is a bare minimum. The remaining recommendations, books in the library, access to bathrooms, respecting gender identity. This needs to be said and should be policy now. Parents and many teachers want LGBT history and culture to be taught in our classrooms. It's part of our American history and culture. However, teachers don't all have the tools to do so. This resolution will give them concrete training. All this is part of our strategic plan. Attacks on Arrington's LGBTQ youth keep coming. We need not just words, but actions that demonstrate to our children that they are beautiful and valued. Thank you. Sophia Westerhoff is next, will be followed by Jocelyn Friedman. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sophia Westerhoff. I live at 26 Shawnee Road. I grew up in Arlington and have attended Arlington Public Schools since kindergarten. I graduated from Arlington High in 2021 and just finished my second year of college. I'm putting forth my support for the Exton Gittleson Proclamation to increase LGBTQ plus inclusion in schools. The statistics about the mental health of queer students are clear, so I want to talk more about my experience as a queer student in the Arlington public school system. Particularly in health classes in middle school and high school, there wasn't representation or information about gender fluidity or inclusive LGBTQ plus health information presented. This left me feeling unclear on how to take care of my own sexual health, and I know many of my peers, in particular queer students, felt similarly. I had to seek information on my own. Now in university, I volunteer at a sexual education center and I run workshops on sexuality, sex, safety, and consent, oftentimes specifically for queer audiences. As a sex educator now, students ask so many questions about sexual health and safety, and they have a right to this holistic and inclusive knowledge. I believe there are well-intentioned health teachers in our schools, and with better training and support, I believe that they can provide education and information to their students. During my time at AHS, I was also deeply involved in the Gender and Sexuality Alliance, or GSA. My senior year, I was one of the co-presidents. Having a community and the support of faculty and other students improved my high school experience. 
Um, we also collaborated with librarians and other staff and knowing that there are people at the school who care about queer students and knowing that the school system has your back can make a big difference to feel supported and safe. While I was disappointed in the lack of LGBTQ plus inclusion I experienced in APS, other experiences in the GSA made me feel safer and more supported as a student. I know there is a community of supportive staff and students within APS and all LGBTQ plus students have a right to feel safe at school. Moving forward, the Exton Gittleson Proclamation is a much needed change we can make within the system. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Jocelyn Friedman is next, will be followed by Elizabeth Dre. Thank you. My name is Jacqueline Friedman. I am an Arlington resident at 153 Medford. I am also the Vice President for Strategy at SECUS, the leading national policy organization on sex education. I applaud the school committee's recent decision to come into greater compliance with the second edition of the National Sex Ed Standards. And I, I'm speaking today to say that the Exton Gittleson Proclamation is an urgently needed next step in this process. Arlington students need to see themselves and the people they know represented in the curriculum that's being taught to them, and students and staff both need to feel safe at school. However well-meaning it may be, the Cardin Amendment would align us with the kinds of people who think that if they erase certain kinds of information from the curriculum, the students who need that information will stop existing in real life. At SECUS, we have seen the data, and we know that inclusive curricula and affirming policies decrease bullying and harassment increase academic performance and make students more likely to stick up for each other if they see someone being bullied. Data aside, let me also say that as a kid who grew up queer and deeply in the closet in a place where it was not safe to even come out to myself, it is heartbreaking to see some of the leaders in my own town once again actively deciding to leave LGBTQI young people to their own devices. We have already let the trans and non-conforming, gender non-conforming students in our schools wait too long while under increasing attack for the kind of actions provided for in the Exton Gittleston Proclamation. They cannot afford to wait yet again. As you've already heard, the policies in the Exton Gittleston Proclamation are all based on the recommendations of leading organizations with expertise in creating environments that keep LGBTQ students safe and help them thrive, including, of course, SECUS. We cannot just say it gets better. We have to take action. By passing the Exton Gittleson Proclamation and voting no on the Cardin Amendment, you have a chance to take a huge step tonight toward ensuring the students of Arlington have the freedom to be themselves, pursue their dreams, and get the quality education we have promised them and that they deserve. Thank no. You. Your time has expired. Thank you. Thank you. Elizabeth Dre is next, followed by Jordan Weinstein. Good evening, my name is Elizabeth Dre. I'm on Jason Street and I'm a town meeting member in Precinct 10. I urge the school committee to vote to support either the original or, or the revised Gittleson Exton Pride Resolution. As we all know, our LGBTQIA plus youth are being attacked both nationwide and right here in Massachusetts and failure to vote in favor of this resolution puts Arlington in bad company. As the parent of a trans child who graduated from APS, I am grateful to Ms. Exton and Ms. Gittleson for proposing common sense policies that may have helped my child and will definitely help current students and future students. And frankly, I am shocked that we are even having this discussion. Uh, and that school committee member, Mr. Cardin, would ask our children and the APS staff to wait when they have clearly asked for help. Wait for what? Our children cannot sit by and wait while the Policies and Procedures Subcommittee undertakes a lengthy review of the school committee's policies to de determine changes that may be ne needed as Mr. Cardin would like. Every day that the policy review takes is one more day where students don't feel valued, seen, accepted, safe. Every day they wait is, will risk further damage to both APF, from APS staff and students, and every day they wait could put them at risk for further depression, anxiety, and maybe one day closer to possibly attempting suicide. The original and revised Exton Gittleson resolution clearly lays out the absolute minimal that we need to do, and we need to do it now. And let's be honest, this is not earth shattering policy changes that they're suggesting. Correct pronoun use, bathroom and locker use, staff education is the minimum that we should be doing. This is not a time for inaction or for kicking the can down the road. How many more youth will suffer if you support the Cardin resolution? How many more will drop out of school? And how would you vote if it was your child experiencing discrimination by their teachers? Your child who didn't want to go to school anymore because they didn't feel safe or your child who is currently hospitalized due to suicidal ideation? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
Jordan Weinstein is next, will be followed by Mustafa Varoglu. Yeah, hi, Jordan Weinstein, uh, town meeting member of Precinct 21. I'm gonna keep it short to give, uh, try to get uh, everybody in uh, who wants to talk. I'm also supporting the original resolution, uh, the LGBTQIA plus affirming resolution number one by Exton and Gittleson, and also their third, uh, or their, their uh, the third resolution, which is uh, a bit revised uh, by Exton. It's described as the Exton resolution. It has everything that we need. Uh, it's time to take uh, uh, positive action and not just uh, uh, voice empty performative uh, support for, uh, uh, for these changes that are uh, very much needed in our schools and are supported by the community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mustafa Varoglu is next to be followed by Jennifer Mansfield. Somebody is self-timing. Is Mustafa online? See, uh, seeing not, Jennifer Mansfield. If he comes back, we'll get him on. Jennifer, you're next. Who will Hi, be can you hear me? Yeah, who will be followed by Chris Martin. Go ahead, Jennifer. Sorry, thank you. Um, I'm Jennifer Mansfield, 44 Franklin Street, um, Precinct 9, town meeting member and parent of two white cishat um, elementary school boys. Just quickly, I expect both my own children and their classmates, teachers, and families to be supported and reflected in the APS curriculum. It, I feel like it is hypocritical of us as a school district to claim inclusion and not take specific actionable steps toward that inclusion. And the Exton Gittleson resolution does this. I believe that the Carter Amendment suggested doing too little too late. And the often quoted by Angelou, I think it really applies here, do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. And I think we are well past the point of of that and we're, it's time to do better. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chris, you. Ma Chris Martin is up. Uh, we'll be followed by Rajiv Sanja. Is my voice coming through? Mustafa's coming up. Okay, Mustafa. Oh, okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I, I didn't. Um, okay, um, so uh, my name is Mustafa Varaglu. I'm a town meeting member for Precinct 10 and I live at 26 Shawnee Road, which is also where Sophia Westerhoff grew up. Um, you heard her speak a few speakers ago. So I'm here to give my support for the uh, Exton Gittleson resolution. Um, this is a specific a resolution with specific actions. And I think the, um, I won't go over all the reasons that you should support this because they're all in the, in the here be resolved. All the, uh, the, the, basically the facts are laid out. Why, um, why these, um, these populations and these, this, um, this uh, group of students and teachers need the support in, um, at, the, at, the, um, at the Arlington High School and in the Ar Arlington Public School System. But what I would like to say is that it has specific actions, actions that can be implemented. And very notably, of course, as the Police Policies and Procedures Subcommittee works to implement these policies, they will of course study them. I mean, that's gonna happen no matter what you do. So you're not taking away from the other am amendment at all or the other resolution at all. You're actually just adding right on top of it. The studying will happen. The policies will be implemented as, as specified here as a, at least as a good starting point to make everybody welcome, make life easier and more supportive and a better environment where the students can be safe and learn to their full extent. And um, I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you. Chris Martin, uh, who will be followed by Rajiv Sanja, who will be the last speaker. Hello, my name is Chris Martin and I'm an Arlington resident living at 70 Alpine Street. And I'm here today to speak in support of the Pride Proclamation by Exton and Gittleson. I think it's incredibly important that our LGBTQIA students are seen and supported and that our non-LGBTQIA students see that support and grow up in an environment where uh, difference is celebrated and understood. I think that can only lead to a more compassionate and caring uh, generation of students. And that's certainly what I want for my three children who are in the ninth grade, seventh grade, and uh, in the fourth grade. And also, if Arlington wants to be a leader within this space, and I believe that we do, having actionable steps as are laid out in the Gittleson-Exton um, proclamation 
uh, that can be measured and evaluated is particularly important. Um, and most important is that we hold our community and our educators accountable and we ensure concrete support for our LGBTQIA students. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Rajiv Sunija is next. Hi. Uh, um, my name is Rajiv Sunija. Uh, I live on 13 Mary Street and I've been a resident of Arlington since 2005. And I have a 10th grader in APS. Um, I am also part of the Arlington Human Rights Commission, although I here speak today in my personal capacity. Um, I wish to speak in support of the resolution affirming LGBTQIA plus community. I find the resolution as penned by Ms. Exton and Ms. Kittleson very strong and supportive of one of the more marginalized groups of students in our community. As others have mentioned, a survey conducted by the school administration found this community of students suffering most from anxiety, stress, and mental health issues at levels far higher in proportion than other groups. At the same time, I also caution the school committee against adopting the amendment as put forth by Mr. Blend Cardin, since it does not fully proclaim the help and support that this group of students require from the administration. Over the past few years, we have seen an increasing number of attacks on inclusion against inclusion for mar marginalized groups across the country. At the same time, I've also heard conversations amongst people that in a self-congratulatory manner, indicating that this will not happen in New England. Well, here we are. Every day we see reports of school district meetings being disrupted, misgendering, homophobic language being reported at constant basis. Right here in our town, we have a proposal to review the health and wellness curriculum that was so urgently required in support of the LGBTQIA plus community. Anything short of a full-throated affirmation of LGBTQIA plus students makes students feel unsafe and unsupported. With this in mind, this is the time to put together our progressive reputation on the line and adopt the original resolution as written by SD members, Ms. Kittleson and Ms. Exton. Thank you. Thank you, and it is now 7.06, so we got everybody in. Thank you very much for your cooperation and patience as we work through the list. Um, so we're now opening the meeting. First of all, um, our student rep unfortunately can't be with us tonight, but our AEA rep is remote tonight. That's Sif Ferranti. And also I want to recognize Allison Elmer, who is our assistant superintendent, uh, for Student Support Services, who is also online tonight. I think that takes care of everybody who is online. Next item of, on the agenda will be an appointment to the Arlington Human Rights Commission. Is Griffin Jones with us either in per Griffin, come on up. Griffin, you're seeking our appointment to the Human Rights Commission. Uh, can you tell us a little about yourself and why you want to do this? Sure. I am uh, a resident of 24 Mott Street. I use he, him pronouns, and uh, I have a doctorate in, um, in social epidemiology, uh, which has me uh, spending a lot of my time looking at civil justice and its impact on health. That goes anywhere from uh, substance use disorder um, to education to our approach to policing and emergency management. Um, I own my own uh, health justice consulting practice, and I currently work half-time um, at Harvard, building an equity uh, hub uh, there, and then half-time at Yale Law School, um, working on medical legal partnerships um, there. And so I'm keen on uh, uh, contributing to um, uh, the pursuit of justice here through the Health, uh, the Human Rights Commission. Thank you. Um, so I guess at this point we'll need a motion to uh, appoint Mr. Jones. Uh, motion by Mr. Thielman, second by. Uh, Ms. Gittleson, um, any further discussion from the committee? Questions, discussion? Hearing none, we'll go for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, opposed? Abstentions, it is a unanimous vote. Congratulations, and uh, we wish you well. Uh, okay, 6.45 p.m. We now come to the point where we say, hopefully at our last meeting, uh, a fond farewell to Dr. McNeil, who is leaving us on the 30th um, for private pastures. <laughs> I'll, I'll start with the superintendent. All right. 
Rod, I came in today and I said, are you ready to be embarrassed? And he said, uh, <laughs> he said oh no, <laughs> what's about to happen? Um, so Rod, I just have a few year words I want to share with you and then I'll turn it to the rest of the committee. You've been my partner in leading the district for the two years I've served as superintendent and you've proven an excellent, reliable and trustworthy partner for those two years and you're someone I will very much miss. You are leaving a legacy in this district of walking the walk when it comes to making our schools a more equitable place for all of our students to learn. You are a fearless advocate for kids, and I'm so happy that you'll find yourself in a place where you can spend every day interacting with more young people, because this is where you shine and thrive. You've developed our leaders to be compassionate while maintaining high standards for themselves and those they supervise, and you have eliminated multiple systemic and programmatic barriers despite opposition and done so with grace and humility. Rod, we have not always agreed. And as far as I'm concerned, that's what makes our partnership so rewarding. While I haven't, while we haven't always agreed, we've always supported one another, and your support of our shared work is something I will always remember and cherish. One of the things I've appreciated most about you is your ability to be candid, to disagree respectfully, and to have the hard conversation until such time as we're able to establish a shared course of action that we can support together. You are a committed, capable, and caring leader, and someone I am proud to have led alongside. I wish you the best in your next very well-deserved adventure, and I will leave you with one more piece of unsolicited advice. Follow your instincts, because my friend, your compass is always pointed in the right direction. I'm gonna miss you. And I will go around the table for an anyone who would like to be recognized to make a comment at this point. Ms. Gittleson. Um, Rod, I have only been on the school committee a couple months, so we have not actually worked, <coughs> excuse me, worked together in that capacity very long, but I was a parent watching Zoom school committee meetings during the summer of 2020, wondering what my entering kindergartner was going to experience in pandemic school, and I really always appreciated your calm and um, reassuring manner. It was it was always a presence that I felt really good about having as I had no idea what decisions everyone should make and I was grateful for the people who were making good decisions. I also was watching the meeting when you volunteered to be the uh, APS liaison to a rainbow task force and truly appreciated that and the small amount of time I have worked with you on uh, the most recent APS pride. So I wish you all the best. Okay, Mr. Carton. Thank you. Dr. McNeil, we've been so fortunate to have you here as our assistant superintendent. This was your first central office role. And we've seen so much growth and development in your time here. You helped steer Arlington through the pandemic, totally reinvented professional development, and brought an equity focus to everything we do. Your tireless efforts have greatly contributed to success and advancement of the Arlington Public Schools. I wish you much success in your new role. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Morgan? Um, I, I also come from independent schools, so I have a sense of where you're going. Um, I counted. Um, there, there are 19 members of the Board of Trustees of the, uh, Chestnut Hill School, and, and I, 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 yeah. Um, and, uh, and, but I know that you will engage with them in the same way that you have engaged with us, and there have been periods of agreement and times of disagreement, and you have, we've always been able to move forward beyond, you know, you know after those times, during them, and I have no doubt that you will take that experience with you. I like to think that I've perhaps given you the opportunity to sort of practice disagreement <laughs> a little bit, um, and, and then you can implement that with all 19 of your new um, employers um, who are so, so fortunate to have them, have you um, at, at the helm of their school, and I'm excited to see what you do there because I think it will be amazing. So thank you for everything that you've done for us. Um, I'm so glad we got to keep you as long as we we did, um, and we wish you the very best. I want to go ahead. No, thank you. I want to thank uh, Rod for his service to our town. I remember when Kathy uh, announced your uh, your hiring; she was ecstatic about having the opportunity to work with you and bring you here to Arlington. And I think she made a great hire, and you've been a great addition to the district. So I think we've been lucky to work with you. As Jane said, um, you have had a lot of practice reporting to a board. I report to a board for a living. I have for many years, and so uh, this is a good, uh, good practice, good place to practice. I do appreciate, as uh, Len said, the equity lens you bring to everything we do. I appreciate the dialogues you've been willing to have with many folks, many parents on many issues, um, and I think that's an important part of our work. My time is up.
Um, I, uh, uh, but your time continues until June 30th. So I, I, uh, I just want to say it's been a great pleasure working with you. We had many conversations during uh, the intense times of COVID, and uh, I think we, we, we all worked our way through that, and it was, uh, and you were always a gentleman. So thank you so much. Ms. Sexton. Dr. McNeil, I also want to thank you for your years of service here in Arlington. Um, the curriculum leaders and the principals in the schools have really benefited from your passion and commitment for curriculum, for equity in curriculum, for believing in what you, um, being committed to what you felt was important and right and leading um, conversations in a direction that, that brought others on board. Um, I also want to comment on the professional development programming that you designed, um, particularly this year, and I hope that it can continue. Um, in your absence, I think the opportunity for teacher choice and the opportunity for teachers uh, to be leaders and support their colleagues in their professional development is, is really commendable, and I appreciate all of the work that, that, that you put into that. Um, so best of luck uh, in your next endeavor. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. McNeil, when we first hired you, uh, I did what everybody does on a new hire, is I hit Google. <laughs> <laughs> and I found this wonderful picture <laughs> uh, of uh, Rod McNeil, principal in Needham. And this, I, I saw that and I said, okay, this guy we got to hire. And he is absolutely a kid-centered ally of great teaching who understands schools. And from everything that I can see from the chair here at the school committee, I've known that the principals and the education leaders in the district appreciate you by their side. The teachers in this district appreciate how you value their work and support them and the children in this district have benefited greatly from your service. So thank you for being with us, and I know you're gonna take a whole bunch of Arlington with you to Chestnut Hill. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Oh, uh, Rob, yeah. Thank you, I w didn't prepare anything, but I just wanna say, Rod, I can't believe you're leaving our office suite. Um, I, when Rod oh, we're going to tear it down in a few I know, months. I know. And we're not going to be, yeah. <laughs> when Rod first came to interview, I remember well, he, you know, he was interviewing with a large committee in this room, and we, he had to wait in our office for a few minutes. And the way Rod engaged with the administrative assistants in the office or benefits coordinator, other people who were in the office who were not part of the interview committee or the interview cho decision, speaks to how Rod is with everybody. Mm -hmm. Whether you are a custodian in the district, a teacher, the superintendent, a food service employee, he wants to know you, know your story, and he treats everyone with the respect that they deserve as professionals. And I will miss that. I will miss you um, as a colleague, as someone who we've done a lot of work together, and I, you know, I wish you luck in your new position. So uh, naturally, I didn't prepare anything either because I was not expecting this. And um, I really appreciate uh, the words. I'm humbled by all the comments that you've made about the work that I've been able to do. Uh, and it has not been just me. It's been, uh, I've been fortunate to have a great team of um, educators within my department and within the schools, working with the principals um, and working with uh, my two superintendents who have come in and have trusted me and um, have given me the room to grow. And I um, have appreciated my time working with all of the school committee members. Uh, like you said, we've been through a lot of tough times and I think that has forged a very close and professional relationship. So um, I appreciate allowing me to have this opportunity to grow and um, I couldn't be more thankful and, and grateful for um, uh, all the things that we've done. And, and I, I appreciate it very much from the bottom of my heart. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. McNeil. Uh, we will take a 10 minute recess to celebrate with the uh, cake over at the side of the room uh, and reconvene. <laughs>
at 729. The Amtrak. We're 29 minutes behind schedule. Um, we're going to try to keep moving uh, because the reward for moving quickly this meeting is exhausting a long agenda and not having to come back next week. Um, so we're now up to the AEF presentation to the school committee. Um, Dr. Homan? I'm going to pull up and drive your slides Thank for you. you. Mm -hmm. um, I'll go ahead and get started, and you can tell me when to move on to the next one. Hello, I'm Judy Geyer. I am the outgoing president of the Arlington Education Foundation. AEF is a 501c3 nonprofit, and our mission is to support and enhance public education in Arlington. And our special focus is on innovative or new programming for the district administrators, curriculum leaders, and teachers to experiment with that is slightly outside the budget but is reasonably aligned with the <coughs> district's priorities that it's worth trying. And if it succeeds, um, we ask our, uh, that the folks who receive our funding to describe its success and think about how to work it into the district budget. And if not, we say, well, that's why we're a 501c3 and providing this experimental funding. I'm here to present a summary of what we did this year. Uh, next slide, please. I want to first start by thanking this body. Um, our donors and event participants really enjoy seeing you at our, at our event, so thank you, school committee members, for attending. Um, I really want to appreciate um, working with Dr. Homan and also uh, Ms. Julie Dunn, who's, who's not here tonight. Uh, we work in really close coordination to make sure that our funding is getting to the schools. Um, and we also benefit from the participation and insight of uh, school committee liaison, currently Ms. Exton, uh, previously uh, Mr. Cardin. Um, Ms. Exton has attended our monthly meetings every Sunday, and we really appreciate her insights, so thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Who are we? We are 14 community members. We meet monthly um, and sometimes in smaller groups more frequently. We have a teacher representative, a METCO parent representative, the district liaison, currently Ms. Dunn, and the school committee liaison. And our funding priorities span grants uh, to the district administration, grants to curriculum leaders to expand curricula across the schools in Arlington, some grants that are directed uh, to teachers to try new things in their classroom, and then about 15% of our funds go to enrichment scholarships for teachers. Uh, thank you. I want to announce a new, a new grant um, that the board approved two weeks ago, and this will go into effect for the 2023-24 school year. And this is a $42,000 grant uh, to support strategic initiative working groups. Uh, and Dr. Homan can tell you more about them than, than I will, but there will be eight groups and we are funding some of the stipends for those group members to meet regularly to work towards um, a lot of the strategic initiatives that came from the strategic plan. Um, this last year, we funded uh, instructional leadership teams. I'm gonna borrow some of Dr. Homan's words. These teams uh, use the district priorities to design and implement action steps um, in their local context, in their local schools. And AEF funds allowed the district to explore how to bring more staff to the table to make sure that they had opportunities to engage with the administration on shared action plans and goals for their schools. Uh, so that is next year's district investment grant. Uh, this year, we had several grants spanning multiple schools. One of them that I'm really excited about was the Understanding Our Differences curriculum, which is a disability awareness curriculum. This was a program that was at two elementary schools, but with our funding, it went to all seven elementary schools, um, and it reached third, fourth, and fifth graders. Uh, we also worked with the digital learning uh, lead, uh, Ms. Pimpercar, Dr. Pimpercar, on expanding the last year's um, new to the district digital learning curriculum for K-2 to grades three to five. 
So um, with our support on the order of $20,000, the district now has uh, Finch robots and micro bits that third through fifth graders are working with. Um, we also worked with the SEL coach um, to bring a new curriculum to the upper uh, grades, uh, upper elementary grades in, in four schools on social emotional learning. Um, we worked with the new visual arts director on integrating screen printing into the visual arts curriculum for K through 12. Um, and finally, uh, we worked with the performing arts department on, for the first time, bringing uh, performing arts at the high school level to, um, to our youngest levels, K through two. Um, and not only did the high schoolers put on a play of Streganona, but that play was part of the K through two curriculum and we saw lots of really cute pictures of kindergartners writing about what the story was and what the theater experience was. So th that's an example of our, um, our grants touching multiple schools. And I won't read all of these, I'll just highlight a few. Uh, we have teachers appeal to us twice a year for to try new things in the classroom. So um, I'll, let, I'll just pick one. Um, at Pierce, the, um, for fifth graders, um, Pierce students learned about street art and skateboarding and skate culture um, and the work of, the, of uh, Keith Haring, a famous artist. And um, at Brackett, I guess I'm highlighting two art ones, the art teacher uh, purchased small animal, mineral, and plant specimens, permanent um, specimens, um, to bring nature into her artwork and, and have students um, focus on how to bring nature into their art. At the high school level uh, and middle, uh, middle school level, there were several. Uh, one I wanna highlight here at the high school is Narratives for Change. These were workshops for students, staff, and also members of the Arlington Police Department to talk about justice and uh, their experience with justice in the community using a structured program called Narratives for Change. Um, and another one is a hydroponic garden. So the high school is going to have um, hydroponic garden that um, will be integrated into a couple of the biology classes and uh, will also produce food that uh, the cafeteria will use. Um, there are more grants listed mm -hmm. here. Looking ahead to the next year, um, Ms. Elizabeth Goodsell will be the next president. Uh, she was stuck in an airport in North Carolina and couldn't be here tonight. Uh, she is currently our vice president and she's been meeting with me and with Dr. Homan through this whole year. And so AEF is in great hands. I really wanna celebrate um, Ms. Julie Dunn. So next time you see her, um, she is moving to a new role next year. I want to recognize her as a founder of AEF, a board member, um, I think she was president for eight years and she has constantly made sure that we stayed on mission. I also wanna highlight for this group that next year our, our work with the district will be coordinated through a new position, um, the grants ad administrator through the business office. And it's really important for us to get started on a um, good working relationship with this person because this person helps make sure that the disbursement of our funds goes really smoothly and uh, make sure that we can coordinate with Dr. Homan and make sure that our grants are funded um, in a way that's aligned with district priorities. Uh, I uh, also uh, want to mention though that, that AEF has had uh, a lot of pleasure in working with Dr. McNeil over the years, so thank you. Um, you came to us for an equity audit mm -hmm. grant. Um, I remember the, um, the Gibbs, when the Gibbs School was forming, um, you and colleagues came to us for a grant on uh, how to bring those Gibbs teachers together and create a culture at this new school. Um, and also in 2020, we were so excited and thrilled and funded right away a grant that you wrote asking for training for teachers on how to learn how to be effective teachers in a virtual setting, virtual classroom. So uh, thank you for working with us. And thank you, Dr. Homan, for making my two years, corresponding with your first two years, um, be really, really fun. It's been a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Questions or comments from the committee? Mr. Card. Uh, so thank you for all you do. And I was so part of the board for a while, but pleased to also pass it on. Um, I'm very excited about um, all of your grants, particularly the understanding our differences. That's something that's, I mean, it's, it was in the district 10 years ago and it, it went away um, because of resources. And so to have it back is, is really wonderful. So thank you for that. Um, and to get ahead of the new grants administrator's job, 
um, because sometimes we, we slip up on this, I'd like to move receipt, approval of receipt of the Strategic Initiative Working Groups grant for $42,000. Second. Okay, we have a motion before us, a motion by Mr. Cardin, uh, seconded by Mr. Thielman. Any debate on the motion? Hearing none, a vote on the motion. All in favor? Yes. Aye. Uh, opposed? Abstentions? That's a unanimous vote, 6 nothing. but we're still able to uh, discuss items under this agenda. Uh, anyone else would like to speak under this item? Can I say a couple words? Go ahead. Um, I just want to say thank you, Judy. It's been a pleasure working with you, and I've really appreciated what the AEF does to accelerate some of our innovative work and to promote a culture of curiosity and inquiry and innovation in the Arlington Public Schools. It really adds a lot to, to our community, and we're forever grateful, and I've really enjoyed doing the 5K, so I hope that that sticks around. Um, and just thank you for your service. Thank you. And I'm sure on behalf of the entire committee, we're very appreciative of your work in AEF. Thank you. Thank you. Next up set is the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Report with uh, Ms. Cradle Thomas. Okay, I have them here, though, so yeah, tell me when to go. Yeah. Good evening. Thank you for having me this evening. Um, and this is a report for the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Justice Belonging Department. First, I would like to say and thank um, the school committee for having this department. I also would like to say that I couldn't do this work without the leadership of Dr. Holman, Dr. McNeil, and all the other cam cabinet members and leadership in Arlington Public Schools. I don't do this alone. We do this as a team, and we're building this department. So I wanted to start there. Mm -hmm. So as everybody knows, we do have, um, we've had this vision since um, last spring, and the vision of Arlington Public Schools is to be an equitable educational community where all learners feel a sense of belonging, experience growth and joy, and are empowered to shape their own futures and contribute to a better world. Um, and the reason why I, I wanted to start there is because one of the things that the department has done is has um, added on to it where we believe in this department that we are designing a multicolored tapestry that will weave together courage, determination, authenticity, and belonging in order to actualize the vision that I just read. So I wanted to just take you a little bit on a timeline of where we've been with uh, this department um, in July of 2021. You all voted to have a director of DEI, so thank you for that. Um, in the fall of 2021, um, the district conducted uh, listening sessions. That's the first thing that we did in this department just to get an idea of what was going on in the community. There seemed to be a lot of things going on. Um, and um, we decided as a district that we um, also we needed to do an equity audit, as you all know. We got the official report from that equity audit, from those six strategic recommendations from that audit. That audit um, helped to inform the strategic vision and mission and the priorities, which you all have accepted, and <laughs> we are off and running right now <laughs> of implementation. So I just wanted to name a couple of things that the department has done this year. Um, uh, we've done professional development, which goes under our strategic goals 2.0, which is valuing all staff. Um, we establish affinity groups um, at the, there are some student affinity groups going on, and we did some um, affinity groups with the educators this year. There was a white affinity group and there was a BIPOC affinity group, which we started. Um, that white affinity group was led by our director of history and social studies, Caitlin Moran, and I did the BIPOC affinity group. Um, the hope is that these affinity groups will um, grow into different um, intersectionalities um, and from those affinity groups that we can have other leaders come and support um, our different intersectionalities in our districts. One of the other things we did 
this year, um, which is under the professional development, still strategic 2.2 is that we are continuing to do the ideas on um, professional development for ed educators. As of this date, we've had 150 educators, nurses, psychologists, um, school counselors, principals, um, and teachers take the ideas course. Some of the, uh, I guess I wanna say some of the uh, stories I've gotten from people who've taken the ideas course is that one of the things is, I'll never forget this as a teacher saying, I've learned that I need to have left-handed scissors mm -hmm. in my class. Mm -hmm. um, another teacher has said that taking a course helped them to find their voice and to advocate for their students. Um, under Dr. McNeil, we organized a, a belonging panel with our educators who shared their stories with their peers. Um, they were brave enough to act to say what belonging meant to them um, working here in Arlington. And then um, Student Engagement Strategic Initiative um, 1.2 um, um, collaborated with Audison to um, do the second annual Audison Day, which was um, May 19th. We had our own Dr. Holman <laughs> and Dr. McNeil. They ran a workshop with other teachers and outside presenters. Um, we did Narrative 4 project for the high school, um, which was in May. That was a success. Our Arlington Police Department, um, we enjoyed it um, and something that we're looking to build upon with what we did there. Um, curriculum Instruction Strategic Initiative 1.1, I collaborated with teachers and coaches. They were reading Kill a Markingbird, um, wanted to really talk to the students in regards to, you know, that there's language in there um, that sometimes can trigger other students. So did a lesson on uh, um, wrinkle, wrinkle My Heart, which is power of our words, how words can sometimes hurt, but how also how can we also do restorative practices with people? How can we ask for forgiveness and learn better? So community engagement that we, I still have the DEI channel with AMCI. Um, to communicate and dis disseminate information in regards to diversity, equity, <coughs> inclusion, and belonging. I meet monthly with um, the town DEI director, Jill Harvey, and the chief of police, um, Chief Flattery. And then I collaborate with the Human Rights Commission and other commissions in regards to other activities, whether in the school or out in the community. Some of the other additional partnerships, um, Rob Spiegel and I are part of the Massachusetts um, Partnership for Diversity in Education, MPDE. We attend those monthly with other um, districts that are looking to bridge pathways uh, uh, for more diversified staff in districts. I am um, part of a new association of Massachusetts school equity leaders, which are de um, DEI directors, um, which is gonna be official in one week um, at the State House. Um, and then my other affiliation is that I am starting my third year at Boston College. I passed my comprehensive exam and I will be um, doing my uh, proposal defense in two weeks. Awesome. So uh, some of the other things that we've done in the Human Resource Department, um, Mr. Spiegel and I participated in the teacher diversification um, PLC through DESE this year. Uh, we're developing a partnership with Cambridge College to create uh, teacher pathways for Arlington Public Schools. Um, and then um, one of the other things that we did as we had changed our hiring practices this year, we also designed a process monitoring for hiring. Um, we do anti-bias training. We have taken names off of cover letters and resumes, which helps to mitigate bias that can ha um, happen in hiring. Uh, so strategic priorities for this, for next year, coming year, I'm happy to say that we have hired a new specialist <laughs> for the department. Um, the department will be a department of two. Um, so I'm very excited by that, um, that we can start to build capacity um, for this department, um, 
And the other thing that this department will be doing, we're going to continue to um, partner and collaborate in the strategic priorities 1.2 and 2.0. And the other thing that we're doing is that we want to ensure that we're increasing um, inclusion and diversity by honoring important holiday, holidays and observations. Obser observations monthly. One of the um, things that the department would like to do is to curate YouTube videos with AMCI each month that talks about what each month is representing and how you can do some action steps. Um, again, partnering with the curriculum leaders, principals, um, to continue to uh, design and develop uh, a curriculum for the um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And then the last thing I want to say is that next year I would like me and the new specialist to do residencies in schools, to be on the ground, to spend a week, week and a half in a school just to get the lay of the land, just to hear what's going on, and that way I can do on the ground office hours for teachers that would want to meet, and that's the other way that we can go into classrooms and do observations. And if teachers need us for any coaching, then we're on the ground. Any questions or comments from the committee? Mr. Thielman. Thank you, Mr. Schlickman. Um, thanks very much for this presentation. I'm really pleased to see how this department has grown because I think it is just, as you said, it's only two years old, so this is great growth. My question, the, um, the affinity groups, what's the participation like in the two groups? Um, actually, we had, I've, we, in both groups, we had over 20 educators in each group. That's good. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I, I appreciate that Dr. McNeil had a new, way, you know, um, curated new ways of professional development. We were able to put it in the professional, professional development menu. Um, I think that was really important so that um, people didn't have to think about could I meet after school, that we can do it during the school it was day. A, it was during the day. Yeah. Oh, okay. And it was really helpful because we, we did a lot of, um, you know, one of the things that we talked about in the BIPOC group is, um, we talked about the book, um, My Grandmother's Hands, um, and talked about really a lot of how you can support yourself, how we can support each other. Um, talked about white supremacy culture, what does that mean? Sometimes we, t we talk about microaggressions. What, you know, sometimes we say these uh, words and people don't know, understand what they mean, so we did a lot of like understanding of things. So there were books, there were, there were topics to discuss and readings yeah. in the, okay, great. All right, thanks, I just wanted to get more. Very good. Other <coughs> questions or comments? Hearing none, thank you for the excellent presentation. Um, yeah. I want to name one thing about the affinity groups since you asked, Mr. Thielman, which is that uh, you didn't mention this in your presentation, but the uh, administration has been participating in affinity groups too. To some extent, those are self motivated at this point. We structured it a little bit and then we kind of let them take off, but they've been a wonderful experience for our administrators to experience what it is to be in an affinity group so that they can promote that uh, build out at, into our schools so that it's not just structured by the district. So we're hoping to see that expand and we know it will next year. And we're also thinking about what that format looks like. But a lot of districts take a lot of time to get that off the ground. And we, like, I have to commend Margaret, we just did it. Um, and we knew it would, would really help people feel a sense of belonging and connection to one another. And it has definitely accomplished that for our administrators, which we know will lead to them facilitating that opportunity for students and for other leaders. Um, Margaret is an excellent relational leader. And I just want to commend you for all that you've done to connect with leaders and teachers and students across our system because it's making a real impact. Um, and it's been a lot of really exciting and excellent work that I've enjoyed doing alongside you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I forgot about that. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Next up, a resolution affirming LGBTQIA plus community. Uh, Ms. Exton. Thank you. Um, first, I want to acknowledge that drafting this resolution has been a more uncomfortable process than I had expected. I know that everyone on this committee shares the same goal to make our school community a safe and supportive place for LGBTQIA plus students and families. I'm deeply appreciative of all the members of the committee and our community. We're all working to achieve the same goal, to do what's best for our students. I believe that we need to resolve our commitment to the LGBTQIA community. We need to do so in words and actions, and we need to do so urgently. 
Over the past few months, the LGBTQIA community's very right to exist has been questioned, and we need to reject that thinking. We, as elected officials and leaders in this town and in this district, must speak out in support of all of our students. We must ensure that we are all working every day to move toward our vision of a district where all learners feel a sense of belonging, experience growth, and joy. The revised resolution that Ms. Skittleson and I have brought before the committee accomplishes these goals. It speaks out forcefully for our students and backs up those words with concrete actions to be taken by this committee. The resolution supports the district's actions to incorporate LGBTQIA people and issues in our school curricula, including in health and sex education. It supports a plan for professional development focused on creating an LGBTQIA plus affirming atmosphere so that all district employees are trained to recognize and support members of the LGBTQIA plus community. And it directs the policy subcommittee to take specific steps to create specific gender affirming policies by a date certain. This is the kind of specificity and action that we need right now. Finally, I do want to be very, very clear that I am 100% confident that under the leadership of Dr. Homan, the district supports the LGBTQIA community and is consistently working to support and affirm our LGBTQIA students, staff, and families. This is evidenced by the establishment of the Rainbow Task Force supported by Dr. McNeil, implementation of district-wide LGBTQIA plus safe schools training in 2022-2023, ensuring schools have gender-neutral bathrooms, ensuring all APS elementary schools have a Rainbow Alliance, hosting a series of community conversations, celebrating the first annual district-wide APS Pride celebration on Mar May 13th, 2023, and many others that I have not mentioned here. However, until every staff member in every school, in every department is affirming of our students and is aware of how to support our students and ensures that every student in our school feels safe, welcome, and included, then the work is not done. Until every queer staff member feels safe and supported in our schools, the work is not done. Until every queer family in our town feels safe and a sense of belonging, the work is not done. And we as a school committee need to communicate loud and clear that we will support and pr prioritize that work. So I would like to move approval of the revised resolution that I have put into Novus and authorize the chair to sign it. Motion by Ms. Exton, seconded by Ms. Gittleson. Discussion, Mr. Cardin. Uh, thank you. Um, I applaud Ms. Exton and Ms. Gittleson for developing a comprehensive resolution affirming the LGBTQIA plus community, which included policy proposals. Under our policies and procedures, the policy proposals would have been referred to our policies and procedures subcommittee. The draft resolution was only made available to us Tuesday afternoon. Upon seeing that policies were included, to avoid having the whole resolution referred to the subcommittee, I quickly drafted a revised version which would, one, endorse the changes in the health and sex education curriculum, and two, state our commitment to affirming and promoting the inclusion of the LGBT, LGBTQIA plus community. The proposed policies would then be reviewed by our subcommittee under our normal process or on an expedited basis if they so chose. Ms. Exton seems to have come to the same conclusion and I fully support her revised draft. I just wish she would have let me know when she was preparing a revised draft so I could have withdrawn mine. We utilize the subcommittee to make sure draft policies are fully vetted by multiple school committee members and the administration. This has not been done with these policies and it shows. As just one example, the policies pr proposed in the original resolution include a specific direction to our librarians. We have never done this, and I believe it's dangerous to start telling our librarians about the types of books they must or must not include in our, libra in our libraries. At the very least, we should hear from our librarians about this. The end goal is to create a set of lasting and enforceable policies. Even if we were to waive our policies to consider the original proposal tonight, the agenda item did not note that policies would be, would be considered, and thus we cannot legally do so. My goal was not to water down the proposal, but to provide something that we can legally adopt tonight. If we decided to flaunt the law, would we be any better than Donald Trump? 
Ms. Exton has been on the committee for three years, including serving as chair until a few months ago. At any time, she could have sent these proposals to our policy committee for quick action, and we could be adopting them tonight. So I would respectfully suggest that some of your ire at tonight's proceedings be directed at her instead of me. I appreciate the revised proposal, and I'm happy to support it. Thank you. If there's no other discussion, I would like to speak. I Go ahead, Ms. Gittleson. I just wanted to speak briefly. <coughs> um, microphone. microphone. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cardin, for supporting the revised motion. I just didn't want to let this opportunity go by without speaking about why I worked with Ms. Exton <coughs> on this uh, resolution. During public comment at the last several school committee meetings, we have heard from many members of the community about the crucial nature of affirming our LGBTQIA staff and students. Over the last day, we received emails and now heard more public comment about the power of and need for this resolution. This is our chance to respond to that comment. We heard from current students, alumni, and staff who stated it bluntly, acceptance and inclusion are suicide prevention. The urgency of addressing this problem cannot be understated. If voting in favor of this resolution and making it as strong as possible mm -hmm. can even have the smallest positive effect on the mental health of Arlington Schools community, Arlington School community, I don't know why we wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. We have seen the data and heard individual stories about the devastating effect of going to school in an atmosphere that is not only not inclusive, but sometimes openly hostile. This is a crisis, and we, as elected representatives of our community, should respond accordingly. It is our collective responsibility to address this urgency head on and affirm the identities, rights, and worth of some of our most vulnerable students. The district has taken important steps in this direction, and I share Ms. Exton's uh, belief about Dr. Homan's leadership here. I think it is time for the school committee to make its own statement. By making this statement, we take a step towards making the efforts across the district clear and consistent. I stand by the resolution that we have submitted as amended, and I hope that we pass it unanimously. Mr. Thielman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, so, you know, uh, I, I'm going to I'm going to support uh, Liz's uh, revised uh, motion. I, 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 I really hope the uh, uh, the the committee can work together harmoniously uh, going forward. I don't I don't uh, like a lot of the the tone, and we're not town meeting thank god we don't make decisions like town meeting we don't uh we don't even re refer most of the time here to motions as you know the exton osh motion or the gittleson motion or the cardin motion we kind of kind of collaborate with each other to try to solve problems and do what's best for the district the dei program that you saw uh tonight on display that that came about by a lot of collaborative decision making and conversations that took place at this table uh, with the superintendent and uh, administrative leadership, and it resulted in a great program that uh, has done great, I think, good good work in the district. And that happened collaboratively without a, you know, a lot of name call, any name calling that I recall. So I hope that we can get back to uh, working collaboratively. Mr. Cardin is right about the rules. I think I think everybody knows that on the committee who's been here for a while. Um, the only option for us tonight would have been to either do a with the original motion would either to do a second uh, reading next week or to suspend the uh, policy adoption rules. That would have been the only legal option for us. Both of them were available to us if we wanted to go down that route. So I am supporting Liz Exton's motion. I hope we can put this behind us quickly. We have a lot of work to do. We have uh, buildings to build, overrides to pass, kids to educate. So uh, and. And when we work together, we do great things that help the town. And we, uh, and when we work as a collaborative school committee, rather than uh, like other bodies in town, we get a lot done. So that's my only comment. Thank you. Thank you. I want to note that under Massachusetts law, the Arlington School Committee is governed by the open meeting law, which means that we cannot deliberate outside of this room. 
Now, I can talk to any one of you about any issue. The only people I cannot talk to or communicate with are sitting at the table ahead of us, which is why we structure our organization the way we do. When we get a topic, what we usually do is refer it to subcommittee so we can sit and have an informal conversation and get to a point where we have something that is ready for prime time at a school committee meeting. Now, uh, I have put resolutions before this committee without going through subcommittees. It's not uncommon. Um, when I saw this one, I, I've got to say that it, it heartened me that at last, after all the controversy we've, we've had since March when the sexuality curriculum was questioned, that we really have not had an opportunity to, to make a, a firm statement. And I want to state in the firmest uh, possible way, as a member of this committee and a member of this community, I fully support the LGBTQIA community and want us to be a leader in creating safe spaces for children, because that's what it's about. It is not about promoting anyone or anything. It is about making safe spaces for children in this district. And as a former principal with a kid who is transitioning at grade three, I know how important this is. Uh, I want to also clarify for everybody, because I've emailed sort of the gist of the statement to people that resolutions are temporary. A resolution gets attached to our minutes and it states our opinion. But the only way we can make action as a committee is to have a formal vote and insert language in the policy manual. That requires work. It is work that the Policy and Procedures Committee, I'm sure, is willing to do because I know that Ms. Gittleson, who is a promoter of this resolution, is a member of it. I'm a firm supporter of everything that she's trying to do with this. And Mr. Thielman is also somebody who's very into social justice and doing the right thing for children. So we're going to get this done. We're not postponing anything. But our policy manual is a complex document. And when we make a vote in policy, we will be putting codifying what's in this resolution into the formal instructions that are passed to everybody in this district, the ground rules for the district about how we're going to do business in a formal process. Sending it to the Policies and Procedures Subcommittee is not killing it. It is enhancing it. It's building it. It's putting it in the place where it needs to be. And I will give you my commitment that we will do this quickly and we will get this in place within the context of the procedures of doing policy in this district. In other words, coming up with a policy proposal, presenting it for a first read, presenting it for a second read, and adopting it to that point. So this community needs to know that every member of this committee is standing behind the children of this district the only disagreement here was with the language and the process and the procedures for getting it done. We now have a resolution before us that I think is an excellent res resolution which both makes a statement and points us to the future action of this committee. And I will do everything I can as a member of this committee and as the chair of the policy and procedures subcommittee to get this done uh, as quickly as possible. The resolution sets a deadline of October 12th to report back. I hope we can do it faster than that. Uh, with that, any other further, co further comments? Ms. Gittleson. No, I'm just pointing at Dr. Homan. Oh, Dr. Homan, okay. Um, mm -hmm. Equity work is challenging and inherently controversial, even when we see nothing controversial about basic human decency. Um, we as a district, as an administration, are committed to doing the actions in this resolution and are already doing the actions in this resolution. Um, when we do so, when we do these actions, we encounter resistance. We are aligned with the committee in our commitment to the values in the strategic plan and to creating policies that are aligned with that plan and to implementing those policies and to focusing on LGBTQIA plus students in measuring our progress uh, towards our goals. And I have been exceptionally grateful for the support of our work that comes from our committee every single day and the collaborations that I have with all of you. 
uh, and that are codified in this re resolution. As a district leader, I've never felt so supported in my work as I do by this full committee and their collaborative work together. And we're really looking forward to continuing to implement those actions in support of our LGBTQIA plus students, staff, and families. So I just wanna say thank you. Uh, we're better together and I leave it to the rest of you to decide what to do. I will now call for a vote. All in favor of adopting the resolution as presented, say aye. 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 Opposed? It is a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is the HGI report. Mr. Jenger, Dr. Janger. So thank you very much for having us. I'm here with uh, Nicole Edson, who is one of the English 9 teachers, as well as Liza Basso, who is also another one of the English 9 teachers. I'm going to take a little bit of the presentation out of order because um, they want to go first. So I'm going <laughs> to tee them up, um, and then we're going to let them talk, which is honestly always my favorite way to go, start with the strong folks. Although it's sort of like going on after Hendrix. It's not a great plan. Um, so just to sort of contextualize this presentation, this is one in a series of presentations we've been making about the heterogeneous English pilot. Um, this is the last one for this school year, although not the final one for this school year's data. Um, this one is going to focus primarily on the um, climate and culture survey. We've already looked at the participation and grade um, information throughout the year and we don't have the final grade so that will be something we will do in the uh, the following so we'll do in, in the fall so yep if you look at um wait a second so if you look at the presentation overview we're going to start with the teacher feedback and their comments on the students and then we will loop back up no no don't go anywhere oh, sorry hold on um, and then we will loop back up to do the panorama um, information and the caregiver survey um, as well as contextualizing some of that. So without further ado, I'll give it to the professionals. Here I'm starting. Which slide? You don't need to pull it they have no slide. Mm -hmm. oh. I just have some notes. Perfect. Hi everybody. <laughs> Thanks for having me here. I'm Liza Basso, one of the ninth grade ELA teachers. Um, so I was asked to share some of our impressions on the year overall. And based on our conversations with all of the grade nine English teachers, we're overall really pleased with how the year went. Um, prioritizing UDL in our classes, we were able to dive deeper into specific skills and content and maintain um, high levels of rigor across levels consistently. The ability for students to work collaboratively across levels allowed for rich discussions and more sophisticated levels of discourse on a consistent basis. Students were able to act as leaders in certain topics and were able to receive support from peers in other areas. In both cases, this built confidence and a sense of belonging in our classrooms. Based on student feedback that we collected using an anonymous end of year reflection form outside of the panorama survey, students felt consistently supported by their teachers to meet challenges. As a result of this support, students felt more motivated and capable of succeeding in English class. So um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what our teacher next steps were, kind of what we were planning for the summer. In the curriculum work days of, over the summer, we plan to review the panorama survey results and discuss some actionable steps, specifically lessons and tools for developing skills around academic conversations. Um, for example, doing some research and learning about and then ultimately, hopefully implementing um, collaborative, collaborative interval training, um, which is a discourse and discussion structure. Um, we were hoping to also share ways we differentiated our instruction and assessments, assessments on a smaller scale, so a daily and weekly um, scale, not just formative assessments, which we have already discussed and aligned. And then we also plan to review our common assessments. These are the writing assignments that all ninth grade students um, complete about three or four times per year. So looking specifically at um, our prompts the rubrics and student samples, and when it comes to student samples, being able to take um, specific student samples 
um, that align with different levels of sophistication so that um, students have an example of when we say, um, you know, what's, what's an honors level? What, is it, what does that mean? What is an honors versus an A? Or what are we looking for when it comes to different, um, what's an A, what's a B? What does it mean to be more sophisticated? Because we can use that word many times, but unless students have samples, they don't, having students' samples is much more helpful and clear and concrete to understand what different levels of sophistication is. Um, and then, you know, our weekly common planning is split, meaning um, four teachers, there are eight English teachers, eight and ninth grade English teachers overall. So four teachers meet during one period and four teachers meet during another period weekly. And we found that the most helpful common planning this year happened when all ninth grade English teachers had a full day to collaborate during the curriculum retreat. Um, so we're, next year we're hoping for more opportunities to meet as a full team, sp specifically to grade norm as that process always leads to a rich discussion, not only about assessments, but also about instruction. Thank you. So why don't we go to slide three? So obviously what you can see here in terms of formative assessment is that the teachers are doing a lot of really sophisticated thinking about how to move forward. This conversation is more of a summative one, right? Thumbs up on sort of whether or not we feel like this is effective as part of the, um, the pilot program. So um, I'm gonna be talking about these outcomes. So these were the outcomes that we said we were gonna focus on for the summative question, right? Honors level participation, student grades, rigorous expectations, equitable access to rigorous expectations, which we defined and we're going to look at through the panorama survey around these areas. Teacher-student relationships, um, classroom belonging, expectations. Um, we will be looking going forward at future enrollment in honors. We, we see it sustaining right now with requests, but we don't really have the numbers on where the students end up when they arrive in the class. So we will have that in the fall, and then sometime by the end of next year, we will have these students as sophomores um, in terms of their outcome. No, actually, we won't have it for a while. We won't have that till the year after next, in terms of this group of students as sophomores taking the MCAS. But it is something we hope, again, we would see positive results in. So what we've seen so far um, is that honors level participation has gone up substantially. Um, and we've seen that student grades have stayed even, which is an improvement since 19% more of the class is participating in honors level curriculum. So now moving to the panorama survey. So that link there, I believe you guys have the summary results. Mm -hmm. So the way the panorama survey is organized is they group clusters of questions into scales. Um, and if you look across each of the scales, these are the scaled results, so that's a combination of a number of questions. Currently what we see um, is no difference in almost all the scales. 4% difference is statistically significant. So if you look at the first two, or not, no difference at all. The next one is down two, the next one is up one. So if you're looking across these scales of classroom climate, pedagogical effectiveness, classroom rigorous expectations, classroom teacher-student relationships, and then you go on to the next slide. Um, oh, you went the wrong way. wrong way. Classroom mindset and classroom belonging, essentially those are remaining the same. That's not great, right? Like we were hoping and sort of expecting, given what we were seeing in classes, to see some more substantial improvements in all of these. But it's important to note that this class in particular scores really highly on all of these things. And if you look at some of the key questions, which I'll do in a minute, um, you will see um, you will see that um, on some really crucial questions, this class already does extremely well. Um, so the one you'll see, which um, is, was low originally and has gone down significantly, statistically significantly, is the scale of classroom engagement. So that was a disappointing outcome. Um, and so if you now go to the next slide, we've gone in more depth through all of these looking for patterns and issues, but obviously this is the one where this is something we're focusing on. It's one of the scales. It's the one area in which we're seeing a statistically significant negative impact. So we wanted to look and understand what's going on. So if you look, those are the five questions um, upon which this is based. 
So these are the questions that can constitute the scale. And I actually met with a person from Panorama to try to say, like, how do we interpret this? What does this mean in context? One of the things they noted, noted, and you'll see that again in the next set of questions, is that all of these ask not a question about did you learn, what does the teacher do, what was going on, but they ask specifically about kind of how interested are you in this class. Um, so there is a way in which the kids were saying, I'm not that interested in this class. Not necessarily that I didn't learn a lot, necessarily that it wasn't interesting when I was there, but I'm not interested. And you'll see that when you go to the next set of questions. So on that set of questions, which would seem to many of us to be asking very similar things, we have very high results and we don't have those negative impacts. So how positive or negative is the energy of this class? 84% are positive. That means extremely positive or very positive. If they said slightly positive, that's not considered a positive result. So that's an extremely high result. How often does your teacher seem to be excited? Teachers were pretty excited in these classes. In fact, that's the one that went up 5%. They are seeing things um, as a positive thing. And this is one which seems to me like the one that we are most interested in. Overall, how much have you learned from the teacher about the subject? So that's 89% of students are saying, We've, I've learned an extreme amount, a very high amount, or a, a significantly high amount. And then you have students still in the middle if it was only slightly high, um, that wouldn't even be considered positive. How interesting does the teacher make what you are learning in the class? Again, this is a high result. 68% say the, the teachers make it very or extremely interesting. And how excited would you be to have this teacher again? 68% um, of students would be very or extremely interested in having this teacher again. So it's kind of a weird thing if I'm a teacher to be like, so they say all these great things about me, the class, they've learned a ton, they like the climate of the class, but they're not that interested in this class. Um, so we're puzzled by it. I think it's something we're gonna look at. We're gonna have more conversations with the students to try to understand how they're interpreting that question and why that one would be going in a different direction. Yep. Um, I, did some, I did some like informal, just asking my students about this specific question. Like what is, what is this, kind of giving them some context. They obviously took the survey. They know what's going on, very transparent. So um, to say, what, what does this question mean to you? Um, and so a lot of them were like, well, I mean, am I excited to go to school? I mean, I don't know, what is this? What, I'm not really sure what this question is asking of me. Um, am I excited to, like, I don't, I'm not excited to go like run laps at my sport, but I love my sport. Um, so I, I think, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm really curious to know more about um, what students or how students interpreted that question. And so I think this is our surmise to some extent, that students are saying to us in the current group of students, and this is something we're not just seeing in this English class, yeah, I'm learning a lot, yes, I'm going, but I don't really want to go to school, right? Like that, that it's, and that is an issue, but it doesn't appear to be an issue necessarily that's specific to this class. But looking at the very worst outcome, because let's be fully transparent, one of the things that the consultant pointed out, and this is true, is that if you look within the engagement, most of the movement is from high positive responses to middle responses. So they are more tepid as opposed to necessarily being negative, mm -hmm. right? So you'll see that more students are somewhat excited um, and more students are slightly excited, whereas some used to be more quite and extremely excited. And that is a finding, interestingly, that the Panorama consultant said of sort of a, a universal, um, a universal tepidness, that there's a move by a lot of students to not negative results on <coughs> lots of questions, on lots of things that they're seeing, um, but to sort of more neutral responses. So that is something we will look at more closely. Mm -hmm. um, so then the other questions that were real focal questions that we wanted to look at um, when we did this survey within the scales, one, obviously a significant concern, in fact, probably the primary concern of everyone when they talk about um, why, whether or not we should embrace inclusion in the heterogeneous model is the impact that, there's a, that there might be some students who are having a ne negative experience on students learning. So that is obviously a big question for us. And so the question was, 
in this class, how much does the behavior of other students help or hurt your, your learning? That remains generally positive, and it's also worth noting that the percentage of students who are actually negative is who are saying that I'm actually being hurt, not just that they don't make a difference, is relatively small. Um, and then the second one that we were looking at, going to the next slide, which was a specific question that we wanted to focus on, is that direct question, how much do you feel like we belong? And again, that remains relatively high in this class. It's higher than the school overall by a substantial amount um, and relatively high for high school students. And then if you look at the sort of more neutral questions, most of the um, remaining students remain in the middle part where they're a little bit more ambivalent, but not where they're not feeling like they do belong. Um, so what does that mean? 2,000 foot thing. Um, I think we are looking at in this that teaching, learning, and relationships remain strong in English 9 um, and are not significantly changed by the inclusion environment. Um, that students aren't that excited about going to class. Mm -hmm. That's our issue um, that we have to work on and figure out what's going on there. Um, and as I said, we see evidence that this is a more widespread phenomenon. There's less excitement about going to school um, and that we'll look into meanings of that. And then um, Ms. Edson and Ms. Basso talked about some of the things we're doing. And one of the things I talked to Dr. Homan about was, so if you go look in the panorama results, they have something called the playbook where you look at the specific areas in which you are looking to improve. And when you go through and you click engagement and you click high school and you click English, the things that pop up in particular are things like, what did you call it, the collaborative interval training? Is that what it's called? The collaborative interval training. Collaborative interval training is um, an approach that focuses on academic discourse, which, shock of the century, is what our ILT has decided we as a school are focusing on next year. It's always great when a plan comes together. Um, and so if you look at what we're seeing elsewhere and what the strategies are that help to address that, we feel like we're moving in the right direction. Um, so that is that. And then moving on to spring data collection. So we also conducted a caregiver survey um, where we reached out to parents and other caregivers to get their feedback. The questions that we put in there we shared with the um, Curriculum and Instruction Committee last month. We asked one question focusing on each of these scales, sort of what we saw as the key or a summative question because we're not gonna, we weren't asking the teachers the full 40. There's not a, uh, Panorama doesn't have an equivalent survey for parents at the classroom level. Because in part, generally schools are not super comfortable asking parents for that kind of feedback about individual classrooms because it gets into a level of teacher surveillance that most schools do not want to practice. So it was very nice actually that the teachers here were open to us doing this even at this level. Um, so if you look, again, my summary response to that is that on most of these um, questions, the parent responses remain relatively high, but interestingly, the parents generally give lower responses than the student responses on the equivalent question. So if you ask students how much they belong in class, 64% respond positively, 57% of those 50 parents that responded, um, felt responded positively. And you go through again, 84% responded positively <coughs> about the overall climate for students, 73% for parents. I, I don't need to read the chart to you. Um, I'll be honest, as a parent of a teenager, I think that may have a little bit to do with how students respond to their parents. Like, you know, they, they, they respond a little more tepidly about going to class. And I think also probably it's um, a little bit of just a result of the people who choose to respond to surveys tend to have a slightly um, stronger opinion. Um, but overall, the responses from the parents were positive and the, they were just less positive than the students. Um, there were 28 parents who in the open-ended response made a comment which could be interpreted as whether they were giving a sort of thumbs up or a thumbs down to heterogeneous grouping. They were more positive than negative, 15 were positive, 
and 13 were negative. The negative comments generally focused on, going back to that initial question, my student is learning, but there are some students who aren't great to have in class. Um, and so, um, you know, that is, I think, a question that we have to ask, but one of the things I think we want to think about is that may be the nature of an inclusion class. That what we really want to focus on, if your student is learning a lot, if their experience in the class is positive, if there's not a negative impact of other students, then there's not a strong argument for moving away from inclusion, which we know benefits all students much more. So we've already done teacher feedback, we've already done student feedback, so now we are getting to the last slide. So going to slide 18, I believe that is. Keep going, keep going, that one. So in terms of the outcomes and evaluation, honors level participation, we've seen significant positive impact on overall participation and equity. Student grades, we've seen overall improvement. Rigorous expectations are generally strong and unchanged in terms of teaching, learning, relationships, and belonging. We need to explore the engagement scale result. Future enrollment in honors, it appears that this increase is sustained to next year. And achievement in MCAS scores, we don't know yet. So next steps in the fall, um, my proposed timeline of presentations and next steps would be that we, in October, when we have the grades from this spring and participation rates for the fall, we come back and give you an update. That in December, we would have term one grades. And assuming things are generally OK and that we haven't found something really horrible about engagement, um, we would make a recommendation for the program of studies for the following year. The things that are sort of in the wind are continuing the pilot, so continuing in English 9, um, and potentially moving heterogeneous English to English 10, so you have comparisons and doing a pilot at the 10th grade level. Um, and then in June of next year, we would come back to you again with uh, the semester one grades, or maybe the quarter three grades, semester one participation rates, and panorama results. Thank you. Members of the committee. Thank you. Um, so thank you for including the full panorama results uh, in, the, in the Novus materials. That's the kind of transparency we're looking for. Um, I do want to point out, though, on the, on the um, expectations section, um, there's four questions. One of the questions has the highest drop of any question in the entire survey. It's overall, how high are this teacher's expectations of you? Dropped 16 percent favor of, uh, from last year. So. I think that's, uh, although the overall expectations blend is okay, I think that question itself is a little bit alarming. Thanks. Mr. Stillman. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, well, Mr. Cardin picked up the, a key point there. Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering to what degree you all took the engagement questions and reflected on your practice in the classroom, collectively, all the teachers who teach ninth grade ELA, not just all of you. Like, how would you assess <coughs> the group's reaction to these numbers and what kind of change in instruction did you guys discuss? This is the teachers. <coughs> we just got these results, so that's um, over the summer, that's our plan, is to look through all the specific questions and kind of like if we were to get a test and we noticed that, oh wow, it, you know, when we go through, let's say, a, a common exam that we give and we say, wow, everyone, most of the kids didn't do so well on question mm -hmm. whatever, um, then that's indication to us like, okay, what did we, what didn't we do or what did we do um, that where they were struggling in that area. So I think we plan to do the same thing over the summer to take a look at those questions and to say, all right, what was it about the classroom where we could have, we could have done this or that or yeah, working with those specific questions. Does that whole, address your question? Is the whole group, in, yeah, that's a question. Okay. Yeah. Is the whole group of, of faculty in the ninth grade involved in the summer activity? Summer Not the whole, oh, the f only the English teachers. I mean the whole ninth grade, yeah. Yes, yeah, in the summer, all the ninth grade teachers. Oh, meet. you guys are meeting to talk Correct. about it. Correct. So we just got these results in from the Panorama survey about a week ago. Yeah. So we haven't had an opportunity to meet as ninth grade. I think that was one of the things when I was talking about being able to meet as a whole ninth grade team, um, a whole English team is 
difficult with the with the schedule with yeah. prep time and and with um yeah just the way the high school schedule works so i think moving forward in the future that's that's something we'd like to be able to do more of is be able to meet all together as a ninth grade team for an extended period of time. How many how many ELA teachers do we have? Eight. How do you react? Let me ask you this. How do you react when you when you see the parents' results and they say it's a good class, but um, how do you react as a teacher to that? Um, which one specifically? It's a good class, Just but. Just the general, Dr. Janger said that teachers, parents wrote in and they said, it was good class, but I didn't like being at my son or my daughter or my student didn't like being in a class with other students who were not at the same academic level, I presume. That's what they were saying. How do you feel about that? Sure. I mean, I also, I think like initially as any human being, you say, oh, geez, like, you know, I think that's a, that's a question where you're like, okay, is, is it me? <laughs> you know, I think that's, an, that's mm -hmm. the first thing that I do as an educator. Is it me? What can I do? I also then try to take a step back and say, okay, um, I also have to look at how many, you know, if there was 400 something parents and only 50 responded and... I, I try to get a sense of, is this an overall feeling? Is this a, and also, I think to have a discussion with all the teachers and to say, hey, what do we think about this and why is this happening? And do you see this in your classroom? Do you mm. not? Because these aren't specific results specific to each teacher. I mean, you know, we just see it as overall, all eight, all eight teachers. Um, yeah, Liza. I also think as a teacher, I see each one of my students as a rich and complex individual with a lot to offer to the class. So the more simplistic perception that the parent might get from a kid after a frustrating day doesn't really capture all of the dimensions that I see on the day to day. So allowing maybe more opportunities for collaboration between students so that they also see each other as rich sources of information. I think that's a goal also for next year, just to make that better. Make that better, all right, good. Um, thank you, that was really helpful, thank you for not deferring to the principal and answering my questions directly. Uh, uh, my, my, uh, so a follow-up question is, I just want to, did, did we have data on how they felt in eighth grade, these kids and all, about their, about anything? So we class specific, so it could be cohort effect. So there's like no data about. We don't, ha we didn't ask eighth grade English. How do you, how do you feel how about you feel eighth grade English? Yeah, we did. How didn't. do you feel about ninth grade English? We will ask this same group of students again at the end of 10th grade. Yeah. Um, so that we can try to see what kind of cohort effects there are. Yeah. Um, I, it gets, a, after a while we're getting into, like I know. I'm running regressions and I may want to do it, but it's like we're really digging yeah. down into the weeds. Yeah, no, uh, running regressions is not the best, always the best use of an administrator's time. Yeah, so, or the staff's time. Make Say what? <laughs> <laughs> I like doing it, I'm not saying. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, okay, fine. <laughs> I didn't like spending a lot of time on myself. <laughs> but um, so, because I mean, I think I actually learned more just talking to my team, my own faculty, and kind of just engaging with them and kind of figuring out what they were feeling on the ground. Um, so um, <clears throat> my uh, next question is, I want some clarity. So you're gonna ask us next year with the program of studies uh, to vote on HGI for all 10th grade ELA. Is that the proposal? I think I'm going to ask you in December what I asked you in December. Well, December's not near yet, so. Um, but the only things that we, I mean, looking ahead, right, the, the only things that have been in consideration at this point would be whether or not you would move, one, continuing English 9 heterogeneous, and two, whether or not it would be extended on to 10th grade. Those are the two questions in yeah. December of 23. I would add one whether or not the structure of leveling the kids within the class is one that we should continue. That's a question that we also have. So well, one of the things we're, yeah. Oh, okay. So one of the things we're doing here and that I would argue um, should be interrogated as impacting sort of the flat effect on experience is that we're still leveling the kids. Like the, they're still leveled. They're just leveled within the same class, which actually makes the leveling clearer to the teachers and to the students. Um, and I think it's worth discussing whether or not containing the structure, but now putting it in one class is something we would want to continue or whether we would want to pilot an honors for all approach to ninth grade in a subsequent year. So yes, it, mm -hmm. it's contained English, the conversations we're having, um, and to whether to move to English 10 and to how to structure in English. All right, I promise my last question. So would, how do you guys feel about honors for all? You like? She just gave it to me. 
Yeah, I feel great about it. That's I think everything want, what that's Dr. Holman said. You want us to take if you yes. vote here. Yeah. How about you? Oh, there's a pause uh, there. <laughs> <laughs> I was not a pause. I'm just being thoughtful about it. I definitely think that's the direction that we would take. I mean, the differentiation is going to happen yeah. for student to student no matter what. I mean, right. when I'm in my honors class teaching honors kids, I'm still differentiating no matter what because every student has a different need. I mean, that's the bottom line. I know that we're asking students to meet a certain set of goals. I mean, if you look at the Common Core curriculum, they don't say this is what we want an honors level kid to do and this is what we want an A level kid to do. We say all students should do this. Um, and so I think in having the, the distinction in the classroom um, is really just a GPA thing, but not a learning thing. All right, thank you, appreciate it. And I would say one of the things, like when you think about rigorous expectations, for example, we, we need to interrogate that, why that one of all the other things dropped. Um, but one of the things that's interesting is so we have students who report they learned a lot from teachers who they report, but 99% report positively, but the teachers know a lot. They have good relationships, and the teachers report that the quality and consistency of the students' work is the same or comparable to past work, if not better. And yet the students feel, somehow are interpreting this experience as one of the things that's gone away is it's less rigorous. And so some of that has to do with this sort of question for, for some folks about how do they make those sorts of interpretations, right? Um, and it's not easy to know what is more rigorous. So I think one of the things that the teachers are looking at doing this summer, which I think will be very helpful, is by providing exemplars of work. I think we can have much more consistent conversations about, you know, when someone says, what does it mean to be doing comparable work or not? Those expectations can be compared across time. So I think that's a really helpful thing that we're doing there. Uh, Ms. Morgan, who likes regression equations? I do, but so, but can we just, the, the kids aren't saying that they think the rigorous expectations are go have gone away, because they never had them to, like they didn't, they, it wasn't like these are, these are kids that you have who have never been in a leveled class before. They had heterogeneous, seventh grade English, heterogeneous, eighth grade English. So they're not comparing this to what used, what used to be, right? The people who make those comparisons are like people like me who has a kid who took honors English, right? And then has kids who are taking heterogeneous English, right? Like we may be able to see that, but the kids who you surveyed aren't comparing it to a leveled class because they've never had one. Right, they're just saying that they're they're saying that this year those kids taking ninth grade English are saying the expectations are not particularly rigorous <coughs> as compared to the students last year who took this class. So the, the kids, I think it's really important, the kids are not making that distinction because this group is a is a totally pure group because they've never had anything else. Right? So that that I think like that to me that it it they they are indicating that they don't that this cohort as compared to the cohort last year is indicating a lower sense of rigorous expectations around what they're doing so i guess what i would say is that we are now making very high level inferences from one question and so we don't know right um we don't know we know that rigorous expectations overall there were some that went up substantially, which is why that scale on the whole remained flat. That question went down, which is a puzzling result, and I think it's something we just need to interrogate. So, um, Ms. Morgan, like I, I think it's important that we look at these questions over the summer and to say, do these students know, uh, you know, what do they understand? Cause the students aren't explained what these questions mean, meaning like they may not. I have to, again, I have to look at what the questions are in that section, those other questions, four questions, to say like, oh, is the word rigorous used a bunch of times? Do they know what that word rigorous means? What does, what does rigorous look like to them? Um, so I, th I think that's, it sounds like a silly ba basic thing to look at, but I, I don't think so. I think if someone was to ask you know, any of us, what, it, what does rigorous look like? What does rigorous mean? Um, we would have to take some time to think about that. And so I wanna make sure that our students understand what that word means. Um, before we can 
evaluate to really, you know, to take any stand on like, oh, this, this is a problem or this is not. Sure. I think, though, that what we're comparing are kids last year who may also not have known what rigorous meant, right? They, they could have been equally confused about it, right? Who knows, right? So what we're looking at really is, is, is deltas between certain things, right? Same thing with the class, right? They, they seem disengaged in some level with the class, right? But they were all taking English last year too. What we've seen is this, you know, a, a, a decrease in their engagement with the class, which, you know, maybe is just a, you know, maybe we're seeing drops in engagement everywhere. And, and some of that can be explained by just like this cohort is not the same. They're not the same kids we had last year, right? Um, so yeah, I just, I, you know, I think um, it, it'll be, I think that it is very brave of all of you to come and present this now in June when you haven't had the opportunity to, you only had it for such a short amount of time. Um, so I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure that, I don't know what those dates were on the slides, but I'm sure when we hear from you in December or October or whenever that is, um, that, you know, we'll, we'll know more about how you thought about it. So thank you. Anyone else? Okay, question. The, I, I'm intrigued by the question of excited about going to class. Uh, because I'm thinking back to my days in high school, and there are some classes that I found more exciting than others. Um, I'm wondering if we've asked that class across content areas so that. We're the, we're the, only, um, <laughs> we're the only ones, ninth grade English are the only ones who have been, um, who, who administered this survey. So I just I do think that's another thing I was wondering myself like well excited compared to what you know I mean yeah. I mean not not that I would want to like ever put like content areas up mm. there and be like, look how well English did or something but it was it's interesting to me to see like w you know and I and along those lines I just to I really want to thank my um, my colleagues for working really hard on this all year mm. and to be the only ones who mm. have been kind of just putting themselves out there in a way that. Um, we're not used to, and also that no other <laughs> people <laughs> have been doing. So um, I just, I do, I want to thank, I, I'm lucky to work with the team that we work with, and thanks to all of you for allowing us to explore this. I'm thrilled you're doing it. The other thing I'd warn you about is if you're going to come back next year and talk about how the kids are viewing the class as more rigorous, uh, explaining what rigorous is <laughs> will, will pollute the uh, cross year comparison oh. because if you stand there and say hi welcome to rigorous ninth grade English <laughs> uh, you know uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Janker just to be clear the question that we're focusing on right now mm. is overall how high are this teacher's expectations mm -hmm. of you mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so that's the question yeah. okay 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 no but I, I think you're doing great work and I'm very thrilled to have you here um, um, does the superintendent have anything to add? Nice work, team. Okay, well thanks. Done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Mr. You. Uh, Dr. Janger, don't move, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the uh, approval of the Arlington High International trips out of order so you can get out of here and not sit through the rest of this meeting. My wife just met so she find out if I was still alive. <laughs> uh, we think so. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Slides. Do I talk? What do you want me to do? Go ahead. Uh, um, whatever you want to do. So, this is not uh, the first of our international trip proposals mm -hmm. since COVID, but it is in many ways feels, I think, very much like a a, a relaunch at this point mm -hmm. because some of the other ones were were running were sort of at the last minute. So, uh, our world language department to alert deserves a lot of credit because they have all been coming to me. Um, discussing various different trips and programming, but the two that are ready for prime time are a trip to um, Taiwan, mm -hmm. led by Zhao Wei Chao, and um, a trip to Quebec City, led by um, Sean, uh, Sean M. Rufo Curran. Um, so they are happy. They're both, I believe, here. Oh, I don't see Zhao Wei. So um, Ms. Carney is here. Um, and Sean is here. Um, 
so they can speak to the itinerary and all the cool things they're planning on doing if you are interested in that. And I'm happy to answer any questions you have about the program. Do you have any preferences in terms of content? We weren't really sure what I'm looking you would at want. You have a big old packet with an itinerary. You have the board mm -hmm. packets for both of them, um, as well as the <coughs> survey, which tries to answer sort of questions that school committees have asked in the past. Why don't we try going down uh, to the committee and ask, let them ask some questions. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, Ms. Morgan. Um, I actually have a comment um, for, uh, for Sean. I um, have always had a really hard time with these trips. Um, the Taiwan trip, I can't support a trip that costs $5,000, but I am um, absolutely delighted. I don't know that I have ever seen on the school committee an international trip that's been at the like $1,000 mark. Um, and that's, um, it's just incredible for making something more uh, accessible and available to so many more students. And um, I'm, I, I know that it can be harder to do that. And I know that it, it looks like you're gonna be expected to sit on a bus with our kids. Um, <laughs> and um, I just, I really wanted to express my personal gratitude um, for uh, bringing something like this forward. I do think that it is the kind of thing that when people see <coughs> it happening, um, that we may get more interest in running mm -hmm. more of these trips that are more affordable for mm -hmm. more of our students. So um, I'm really looking forward to supporting that one. I haven't uh, supported an international trip in quite some time. So um, I'm excited to vote for that one. Okay, so first we'll entertain him. Well, Ms. Ms. Morgan, would you like to make a motion to approve I the would, yes, I sure would. Yes, uh, I would like to make a motion to approve the uh, very uh, fiscally responsible trip to Quebec. And a second by? Second. Uh, Ms. Gittleton. Okay, uh, any other discussion on the Quebec trip besides February cold Quebec? Hearing none, all in favor? Yes. 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 Opposed? That's a unanimous vote. Uh, now I'd entertain a motion on the Taiwan trip. Who'd like to make that? Mr. Thielman. I move the approval of the Moves Taiwan approval trip. of the Taiwan trip. Second by? Second. Uh, Ms. Exton, um, any further discussion on the Taiwan trip? Can I ask a question? Go right ahead. What, how, as the newest member, of, I've never voted on one of these before, I, I share I've seen Ms. Morgan talk about the equity issues before and followed it not super closely. Um, how, what do we do to address how very expensive that is? And, and maybe for other comparable trips in the past, have, we, have those efforts made a difference? Dr. Jenger. So one of the challenges of leading or allowing these international trips to happen is just the equity of access. Even a $1,500 trip is prohibitive for some families. Um, I think the trade-off that we make as a community is that because we offer international trips, we are able to make them accessible to many students who would never have that opportunity through any sort of private provider or anything their family could do on their own. Um, the way we do that is in part, um, we set aside $10,000 a year for scholarships, which is, you know, it does not make them equally accessible, especially with some of the more expensive trips. The trips do fundraising um, towards those, and one of the things that we plan for going forward is to offer a mix of trips so that, you know, there are trips available at different price points. So things like the Quebec trip have in the past been sort of every year or two. Um, in s the Spanish program, we've looked at Puerto Rico um, because you can get there. Um, and so alternating those with cheaper trips, there's been some discussion about overnight trips that are domestic, that are more hist history focused or other things. <laughs> so there's a mixture of travel opportunities. Um, Taiwan is at the high end. Um, the reasoning behind that, is there's a secondary equity issue which is equally representing all of the language programs. So we have a large number of students who are committed to the Mandarin program, and if they're going to go to a native Mandarin pro country, it's mainland China or Taiwan or Hong Kong. Um, 
And so Taiwan is actually kind of a nice option um, in terms of being a little bit more accessible, but it's a very, it's far away and therefore very expensive. So fundraising, we are hoping, I think as a lot of these things were in place before, um, to be able to do more fundraising to increase the accessibility in the international um, scholarship fund. Um, last year when the, inter when the, the many points to Papa, um, when the uh, music trip went to Italy, um, all the students who requested financial aid were able to be given what they requested. So, um, uh, so if we, so we have $10,000, if the trip is. So uh, if Dr. Homan hasn't taken the money back from me, we actually have $15,000 <laughs> next year. <laughs> and, and so do, how, what, what, how, how big are the scholarships or do they vary per student? They vary. I mean, so we look across the group of students that apply, we look at the level of need that they have, um, and then we make a determination based on need and merit. And I'm, I know it's in the materials, but how many students is the Taiwan trip proposed yeah, for? Well, I mean, we take as many, usually we take as many students, we, we, I don't believe we've capped a student a trip recently. The Mandarin program has about 125 students in it next year, um, so it, we're not expecting that when, you know, the Spanish program is much bigger, the French program is much bigger. Um, so we would hope anywhere from 10 to 20 students. The price goes down as we get more kids. Um, it's a little bit easier to run them. Um, Realistically, and you know, we are 14% free and reduced price lunch. If 14% of the students were requesting it, we could not cover it. Um, so, so I'm sorry, 14% are the of. I mean, if 14, if if it was representative of our student population, and we had to fully fund 14% of the students, we would we would run out of money pretty quickly. So it ends up being a smaller number. Though also 14% is a pretty. Look, I mean, there's a lot of kids who don't qualify for school Absolutely. lunch who can't Absolutely. afford a $5,000 no. trip. No, I mean, so, and that is, that is the trade-off. If we're going to run programs like this, we're doing it because it gives us the opportunity to have some students and more students participate. And we try to have a mix to make it accessible. And there's a long-term goal. We really want to expand that. Okay, thanks. District-wide, we are 10% low income, but we use a <coughs> qualifier, and that's the qualifier we use. We use the state's qualifier for low income, so they don't have to apply for benefits in order for us to qualify them for a scholarship, because not all families apply for free and reduced okay. lunch, so we've been using that as our indicator for scholarships. Yeah, in the scholarship, the family shares what they think is appropriate <coughs> in terms of need, um, and then we just make a determination based on what we have. Hearing no other comments, I'll do a vote. All in favor of approving the trip to Taiwan, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, that is a four to two. Uh, the chair is voting in the affirmative. Why don't we do this by roll call just to make this clean? Uh, Ms. Gittleson? No. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? No. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Uh, Ms. Exton? Yes. And the chair votes in the vice chair votes in the affirmative. That's a four to two approval. Thank you, Dr. Janker. Thank you all very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next item on the agenda: uh, uh, the goals. Okay. Dr. Holman. Uh, there are some minor revisions to these goals to make them a little um, smarter. Uh, with a little bit of uh, tweak to inclusion of outcomes so that we're articulating and doing these action steps, here's the outcome we're looking for, particularly in strategic priority <coughs> one where we've articulated outcomes related to student outcomes um, and in strategic priority two where we've articulated mm -hmm. data that we're going to follow and track to improve mm -hmm. retention, recruitment, and professional development. So um, those are the only changes that were made. The actions articulated in the uh, goals are the same. Okay, members of the committee. Okay, on a motion by Mr. Thielman, seconded by uh, Ms. Exton uh, to approve the goals. Any discussion of the motion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Um, no abstentions either. It's a unanimous vote. Thank you. 
Um, override update, Mr. Cardin. Thank you. Um, so on June 5th, the select board voted to call a special election on November 7th, 2023 for the purpose of a vote on a proposed Proposition 2.5 question. They also voted to um, put a question on that ballot for a $7 million general operating override. They further voted to approve a draft set of commitments subject to some changes that were noted at the meeting. Mm -hmm. um, the select board chair is presenting a revised set of the commitments at their next meeting, <coughs> which is not until June 26. Um, so typically I looked up what we've done in the past. And uh, in, tw in 2011, we, our vote was to support the language of the override question and approve the commitments. In 2019, our vote was to adopt and vote the long range plan FY20 override commitment. Um, uh, the chair who is not here would like us to take a vote tonight. Um, and so I think there's three things we can, well, there's two things we can do. We can vote to support the actions taken by the select board, um, or we can vote to support the override. There's nothing as a body that keeps us, that prevents us from affirmatively supporting the override. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we voted on support of other ballot mm -hmm. questions. So um, we haven't done that in the past. I'm not sure why, but I'm open to whatever the, the committee would like to do. I'm happy to listen to the committee. Um. <coughs> the choices are mm -hmm. vote to support the actions taken by the select board with regard to the override election or vote in support of the proposed override. So either way, we pretty much the same thing, the same result. <coughs> same outcome. Yeah, I mean, technically, the, <laughs> the first one is, is approving the, the, um, the asking the voters about an override, right. and the second one is affirmatively supporting mm -hmm. the override. All right, I move that we affirm, I move that the, the Arlington School Committee supports the uh, November 7th override. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Thielman, second by Ms. Morgan. Any discussion on the motion? Is that language good? Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll have a vote, and we'll do this by roll call just because it's so important. Ms. Gittleson? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Ms. Exton? Yes. And the vice chair votes in the affirmative. It is a six nothing unanimous roll call vote. Uh, superintendent's update. Uh, Good evening, everyone. Um, congratulations to the class of 2023. We enjoyed a wonderful, if a little bit drizzly, mm -hmm. um, graduation ceremony a couple of weeks ago. I would like to update you that our crossing guard champion, Linda Corella, was honored at the State House recently. There's a press release linked mm -hmm. in your materials, and if for any reason you can't actually access that link, I'm happy to send that um, or edit, upload it to Novus later. Mm -hmm. uh, this has been posted on the APS website and socials. We're very proud of the work that our crossing guards do to keep our students safe on the way to and from school. I'd like to mm -hmm. congratulate Stratton student Anna Bode, who was selected for the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation 2023 Children's Congress in Washington, D.C. You can see <laughs> Anna's story at the link that's in the slides, and I strongly suggest you watch it. She's going to be an incredible advocate um, as she grows up and becomes a citizen of Arlington. Uh, National History Day national competition was this week, and one project has advanced to the top 10 in the nation, which is spectacular. We're so proud of them. And one outstanding affiliate entry winner for Massachusetts, the title of that um, project was Now I've Got the Pill, Oral Contraceptives, and How They Changed the Lives of American Women. Good for them. Mm -hmm. And one project won first place in the junior group website category. That uh, project was entitled mm -hmm. Park versus Pennsylvania, Pioneering the Right to Education for Children with Cognitive Impairments. Super proud of our students um, and their brilliant projects. Mm -hmm. In addition, we have completed several administrative hiring searches. I don't have all of them listed here because they didn't fit on the slide, um, but I will share some of the ones that are more recently completed. Congratulations to our new Stratton principal, Amy Kelly, who has jumped right in and uh, been at the school meeting students and teachers and hosting meet and greets with families. Uh, congratulations to our new assistant principals at Brackett, Michael Amaral, and at Bishop, Erin Spinney, who will remain. She was the interim this year and previously the assistant principal at um, Stratton and Michael is new to the Arlington Public Schools uh, and is a music educator in his current district. 
uh, our new director of research data and accountability, which is one of our newer positions this year, uh, will be Matthew Coleman, and we have posted for an interim director of mathematics um, because the continuation of this role or integrating it into the fiscal 25 budget would require the override, so we're going to post for an interim math director uh, while we see how that goes. Ongoing administrative hiring searches in addition to interim math director are for Hardy Principal. We've completed our initial round of interviews uh, and congratulated our finalists today and informed the Hardy community of those three finalists. The final round will take place on Friday and Tuesday, and I'll share the finalists with the full community tomorrow. And our, we have a new, new opening for a middle school special education coordinator, and that is posted. Um, I also want to thank our workplace students and teachers for their work honoring our fallen heroes. The Memorial Day display of flags um, up on Park Circle was beautiful, and uh, they work collaboratively with our uh, Rotary every year to do that display. So thank you to them for their work, um, and your enrollments are in your packet. I'll take any questions. Questions for the superintendent? Seeing none, we'll move on to approval of job description. Um, so there is a job description that's been reviewed by CIAA yesterday afternoon um, and has been forwarded for your consideration. This would be a one-year grant-funded project designer who would be designing onboarding programming. This is an area of need that's been articulated through negotiations um, with Unit D. It's been something that we know is a need, uh, but it takes time to sit and design onboarding programming. Um, so we want somebody to come in and design it in a moment where we have a lot of new administrators also implement a lot of it um, as we welcome new paraprofessionals and hopefully have a fully staffed school system next year. We would like to also do some implementation of some onboarding programming for paraprofessionals. And what we really want this designer to do is spend a year designing what the program looks like, what the outcomes are, what the deliverables are for our onboarding processes and our mentoring programs. Um, and get this in writing and make it sustainable so that they can deliver it to us and we can execute on it. Um, so this is a need that's been articulated. We've collaborated with the AEA on the development of this job description and are really uh, co like collectively looking forward to having someone to do this design and then hand it off to us to sustain. Motion by. Move approval of the job description for the leadership development and onboarding program designer. Motion by Ms. Exton, second by second. Mr. Thielman. Uh, any questions or comments? Hearing general, we'll go for a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It's a unanimous vote. Thank you. Um, we've done the high school trip, so we're now at the year end financial update. Due to a personal emergency, Mr. Mason couldn't be here. You have the um, documents uh, for the financial report memo, and I will do the presentation with an update on ESSER 3 uh, now, and I'm happy to take any questions and attempt to answer them. Uh, if there are concerns about the report that Mr. Mason gave you with regards to conducting the transfers that we need to conduct at the end of the year, then we might need to hold a special meeting to address them um, since I don't have him here to answer questions more explicitly. Um, I'm going to pull up the ESSER report and walk through that. It's very brief. So, as you know, we received ESSER dollars um, in multiple installments and in multiple different grants in order to address uh, the needs of our students during and across the course of the pandemic. Al APS was allocated $1.13 million in uh, ESSER funds. We had three initiative options that we shopped to the community uh, back in 2021, and the community uh, chose to support and move forward with option B, which was to ensure student access to consistent and equitable instruction, a focus on tier one. Um, so, we had some core initiatives associated with that when we launched it, and we've adjusted some of our action steps, but we've stuck with the goal of moving towards this, uh, these initiatives. So we were going to support the Comprehensive Equity Audit and Strategy Development. Uh, the positions that are in the ESSER grant for next year are moving towards this because we're hiring a DEI specialist. 
uh, expanding teacher leadership capacity system wide. We've uh, we were going to use actually the grant the ESSER three dollars to increase ILT stipends. We've found a way to integrate that into the base budget next year using some revolving funds. Um, so we're hoping that we won't need to use ESSER dollars for that. But initially that was part of the plan. Uh, resources to support mental health engagement and school culture and accelerating and improving our APS coaching models which we've completed at this point so there aren't dollars allocated to that in FY24. So here's the expenditures to date and our FY24 overall spending plan linked to those four core initiatives. Um, you'll see the FY24 budget in that right hand most column and the only one thing that's not still being funded on that is the improvement of coaching models because that work has um, been completed and is now being implemented. Uh, so on the spending plan for FY24 are the following things. We have communication specialists. Uh, it's funded at a level of 1.0, but it's split between a couple of folks who will be part-time. Um, an assistant director of high school counseling, which you were aware of, uh, DEI specialists. We've hired one, um, and we hired that individual in at a, a relatively high pay rate, so we're deciding how to use the additional allocation of that. Director of research, data, and accountability um, is one we've just filled. A family liaison at Gibbs, which you've approved the job description for and is currently posted, and we're working on hiring for it. The leadership development and onboarding coordinator that you, or onboarding program designer, so how that should read, that you just approved, um, and elementary literacy professional development, a significant allocation going towards our rollout of the new elementary literacy curriculum. So that's the plan for ESSER 3 for FY24 so that we can spend those funds all the way down. And I'm happy to take any questions about that or the financial report to the extent that I can. The financial report includes two motions. One motion to increase the elementary education budget category by 598,000 and decrease secondary by 598,235 and decrease secondary by 468,036 and decrease special education by 130199. Can we do it all by one motion? Okay, uh, yeah, we can do it all by all one motion. And then the, the other mo uh, component of this combined motion will be increase the other budget category by $940,054 and decrease curriculum instruction category by $542,381 and special education by $305,365 and administration by $92,308. Those, uh, those are the two motions presented by Mr. Mason. We'll combine them to one vote if that is the desire of the committee. Mr. Thielman. Can I move adoption of the, of the uh, motions? The, the budget transfers. The budget transfers uh, as, as described by Mr. Mason. As presented, yes. As presented second by second by, second by second. Uh, Ms. Exton. Any questions or comments? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? That's a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. Um, Policy and procedures. Um, we have for second reading one deletion, which is file IJ-R, and we have four uh, files th that will be in our policy manual for second read, file IGD, file KE, file KE-R, and file IMA. There's a slight correction to, I think it was IGD, Mr. Thielman? Yeah. Uh, just a technical correction to that. Other than that, these are as presented for first read. Uh, I'm looking for a motion to approve this package. So moved. Moved by Mr. Thielman, seconded by Second. Ms. Gittleson. Um, any discussion? Hearing none, uh, all in favor? Yes. Aye. Yes. Opposed? That's voted. Uh, we are now seven minutes behind schedule. Uh, we have before us, um, as, as I asked to put into the agenda uh, at the last meeting, um, Regis Road used to be a pothole-filled mess. Somebody went and paved this private way, and now we've got cars speeding down at Regis Road, intersects uh, the corner of Everett Street right at the uh, northwest corner of the Thompson campus. Uh, a lot of school traffic and pedestrians there, and there's no traffic controls. Uh, 
I have presented uh, for the committee a letter to be sent to the select board with your approval. So I'm looking for a motion to approve. So moved. So okay, motion by Mr. Cardin, second by Ms. Morgan. Any comment or discussion? Yes, so, Mr. Cardin. A, a question through the chair of whether the whether admin has contacted the police department or town manager about this? Yes, uh, they, they, they have sent a request to the uh, select board who is sort of kicked into TAC and TAC is sort of kicking it back. And uh, I, I think we really should uh, put a letter in and, and stress the urgency of this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? Hearing none, all in favor? Yes. 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 Opposed? And that's a vote, 9-10, consent agenda. Um, all items on the consent, uh, uh, all items listed on the, w with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There'll be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests. In which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence, warrant 23288 in the amount of 747,000. $26.60, warrant 23293 in the amount of $1,334,840.16 and the draft regular school committee meeting minutes for May 25th, 2023. So moved. Moved by Ms. Exton, seconded by Ms. Gittleson. All in favor? Yes. Aye. 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 Opposed? That's approved. Subcommittee liaison reports. Budget, Mr. Cardin. Uh, we will be scheduling a meeting uh, after the close of the school year. I'll check up on people's <coughs> availability um, to uh, wrap up this year, uh, talk about the uh, initial money in the override, and um, uh, do a, a debrief of this year's budget cycle. Excellent. Thank you. Community relations, Ms. Exton. No report. CIAA, Ms. Morgan. We met uh, earlier this week, yesterday. Yesterday. <laughs> uh, and talked about the, uh, wow, the job description. We talked about the school improvement plan um, template. Project U. Project U. Project U at Gibbs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know what else. I think that was it. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a great meeting. Mm -hmm. Uh, facilities, Mr. Thielman. No report. Policies and procedures, as noted in the agenda, we've been asked to look at ADF, Nutrition and Wellness Policy, JLCD, Administering Medicines to Students, and BEDH, Public Comment at School Committee Meetings, as well as now the uh, LGBTQ plus uh, agenda. So we're going to be busy over the summer. Uh, prepare for a couple of meetings. Uh, yes. When you do the wellness policy, can you put me on the invite? Because I sat with them all year while they wrote this. Oh, that would be excellent. I'd love to have you there. I would just love oh, to be there, too. Oh, man, yeah. <laughs> yep. Mr. Thielman was uh, chair of the subcommittee when we did the, I think it was the allergy, and that, yeah. that, that was complex. I admired your work on that. I let others do the work. Maybe you're going to admire my work too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Don't you worry. There are the, the, oh, well, the revisions in, are yes, significant. Yes, yes, These you, revisions are significant and, and are going to require discussion and thought. Uh, just just to be aware. And an implementation plan. And an implement. Yeah, I mean, okay. So so we've got work to do. Our Arlington High School Building Committee, Mr. Thielman. Well, we had a great <coughs> tour of the building. Four of us went. Yeah. Liz, Paul, Len, and I, and uh, it was a beautiful, uh, it was just a great day. Mm -hmm. The building's doing great. We're, um, I don't want to stay on schedule. We're on budget, and uh, <laughs> we're moving along, and on October 11th, it will turn over. Everything but the preschool will turn over on phase two, and so people got a chance to look at everything, the plaza, mm -hmm. the uh, library, the cafeteria, the, um, the plaza stairs. Yeah, it was yeah. beautiful. Uh, we got to go to the very top. And take we were the on the roof, yeah. We were on the roof. We checked out the uh, equipment up there. Don't exactly know how it works, but we checked it out. <laughs> it just great. So it was a great, beautiful day. So thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you. And those of you, uh, and I don't know if we're going to do any touring, but we, there'll be a tour of service. Some of us, probably for all of us, rather, um, sometime in October. And then 
for the public would be something I don't know when, probably the new year. Thank you for the invitation. I, I really enjoyed it. No more boots, hard hats, yeah. <laughs> gloves. Helmets, not hard hats. I know. Helmets. Helmets, yes. The standards have changed, upgrades. Yeah. Uh, liaison reports. Yes. Uh, I went uh, Tuesday, it's been a long week, to the final CPAC meeting of the year. Um, Mr. Cardin had emailed them to update them that there is discussion in the budget committee regarding giving them a, a, a budget and there was appreciation for that and mm -hmm. that's pretty much all I have to report. Uh, I attended the uh, ceremony in downtown in the State House for the uh, traffic supervisor uh, uh, from the Hardy. Any other reports or announcements? Future agenda items. Hearing none. Item future meetings. Uh, we are scheduled to meet tomorrow. Do I hear? Uh, we, we, we uh, not tomorrow, next Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Back advancing tomorrow. the schedule, you know, <laughs> we're making time. Um, I think we've cleared our agenda, so do I he hear a motion to cancel the meeting of the 22nd of June? So moved. Motion by Ms. Exton, second by Ms. Gittleson. Uh, any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, opposed? That's a unanimous vote. Don't show up here next Thursday. Um, the other thing is, is there may be items that we want to talk about over the summer, and certainly it wouldn't be a bad idea to either have a retreat or some other meeting where we meet some of the new people who we'll be interacting with next year. So make sh just make sure that Ms. Diggins has your summer calendar for the ease of making a meeting schedule over the summer. Uh, and we now have a executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union, which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect to consider strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Collective bargaining may also be conducted and to discuss a potential memor memorandum of agreement between the school committee and AEA Unit A mentor stipend. Do I hear a motion for going to executive session? Motion by. So moved. Mr. Cardin, second by. Mr. Thielman. <laughs> uh, <laughs> requires a roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Gittleson? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Ms. Exton? Yes. And I'm voting in the affirmative, 6 nothing. We are going to executive session. We may come back into public session. Thank you. We have returned to regular session at 9.28 p.m. We have before us a memorandum of agreement between the Arlington School Committee and the Arlington Education Association Unit A pertaining to stipends for curriculum mentors. Uh, we have voted this in executive session. We're voting this again in public session. Motion by Mr. Thielman, second by Ms. Gittleson to approve. All in favor? Yes. Uh, yes. yes. Opposed? Unanimous vote. Looking for a motion to adjourn? So moved. Mr. Thielman mo moved. Ms. Gittleson seconded. All in favor? Yes. 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 Uh, opposed? We are adjourned at 9.28 p.m. Seven minutes early.